Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this ninth edition of the European Conference on Rare Diseases. Every second year since 2001, Eurodis, in collaboration with its partners, has organized this conference in order to measure and inspire progress in the complex field of rare diseases. We are proud that this year's conference shows increasing interest. This year's conference gathers almost 900 participants from all over Europe and beyond, and from all stakeholders. This includes a growing number of healthcare professionals who are, as clinicians, are involved in the groundbreaking task of organizing and building collaboration and knowledge sharing through the new European reference networks. The title of this year's conference is 360 Degrees, Collaborative Strategies to Leave No One Behind. The conference is divided into six thematic tracks, putting spotlight on essential aspects of how to create a positive environment for rare disease patients to gain access to diagnosis, care, and comprehensive support. The program integrates an innovative new track on e-health reflecting the potential of new IT solutions to enhance patient involvement in the development of quality care, and another bold new track on economic perspectives in rare diseases. There are six themes, but they should be seen in a collaborative context. Thus, different elements converge to pushing advances in the management of rare diseases. This while doing our utmost to leave no one behind we must continue to reduce inequalities among patients living with rare diseases. We must continue to eliminate the differences created by where children happen to be born with a rare disease. And we must enable access to medicines. We must grow the number of rare diseases where therapies are available and ensure timely diagnosis for still more rare diseases. And we must create these avenues for a global and efficient management with active involvement of patients themselves, recognizing their specific expertise to assess value and ethical aspects of new approaches. As rare disease patients, we are optimistic about many of the new developments that we have seen over the last two years since the last ECRD like uh, the International Corporation EADIC's new ambitious goals for diagnostic advances in rare diseases, like the whole new area of genome editing, or like the European Reference Network's new clinical structures to enhance knowledge generation and sharing. And we are happy to see the still more positive dialogue on how to undertake collaboration on health technology assessment, HTA. As Eurodis, we are thankful to the EU Commission for its continued support to launching initiatives and programs to inspire and facilitate cooperation within Europe and between Europe and other parts of the world. We must insist on the EU institutions to maintain their leadership and continue to pave the way for structured yet voluntary collaboration between member states. Member states should be gently pushed to integrate the collaborative structures on rare diseases into national health systems and national plans for rare diseases. We must continue to cash in on progress by sustaining and further develop a supportive environment for all in involved in this challenge. Focusing on European reference networks and on orphan products, though very important, does not encompass the full range of needs of people living with rare diseases and does not provide a comprehensive strategy. To this end, we need a renewed policy framework for, for rare diseases. So Eurotis, the European Organization for Rare Diseases, is calling for a strong drive from the EU institutions and in particular, a reaffirmed leadership from the European Commission in the area of rare diseases. We owe much gratitude to the EU Commission, the Council of Ministers, and the European Parliament. But I also want to thank our national host, uh, the ProRa of Austria, uh, uh, as our co-host for this conference. 
And I also want to thank uh, our co-organizers, the um, DIA, uh, the Drug Information Association, uh, which, as with previous editions, uh, has been a great support, and now also Offernet for the first year, which I'm very happy of. And not least, I'd like to thank an outstanding program committee. You can see all the names and faces in the program, co-chairs for this conference, and members of, uh, of the themes, theme leaders. And finally, all the conference partners that you'll see listed in the program. So by this, I'll put, uh, I'll put an end to my welcome words, but I wish you all a very fruitful and inspiring conference and a lot of time sharing knowledge and experience together. Thank you very much. And by this, I would like to invite Magdalena Dagor uh, to, uh, over here, to, to join me here and say a few welcome words. Magdalena is Associate Director of uh, the DIA, the Drugs Information Association, based in Basel. Uh, and DIA has been very supportive of the uh, concept uh, and new strategy of patient involvement over many years. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen, it's a personal pleasure and a privilege to welcome you on behalf of DIA, Drug Information Association, to the ninth European Conference on Rare Diseases and Orphan Products in Vienna. Although I'm still a fairly new team member of DIA, the issues surrounding the rare and ultra-rare disease patients are very familiar to me. It was my previous roles with the industry when I experienced the complexity of orphan drug development, the challenges of timely and correct patient diagnosis, lengthy approval and market access process, in patient, importance of patient support and education around the disease and treatment. The significance of dedication, commitment and collaboration in attempts to bringing life-saving treatment to often very isolated, singled out patients. Today, I am very proud to be here and very humbled to represent DIA. Although very often seen as a regulatory focused organization, DIA has been collaborating with partners like Eurordis, among many other, in advocating for the patient voice for more than a decade. At DIA, we believe patients should be at the epicenter of the drug development life cycle. Since the launch of its first patient fellowship in 2006, DIA has brought patients to the table as equal stakeholders in numerous global patient engagement initiatives, providing fertile and fruitful collaboration among patients, researchers, industry payers, and regulators. I'd be happy to quote some examples. These include the Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative, European Patient Academy on Therapeutic Innovation, Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute sponsored patient engagement workshop. As the call for meaningful and impactful patient engagement grew stronger, so did the push for the increasingly empirical approach to address the topic. And so we continue to drive the movement towards evidence based patient centricity and engagement across the entire healthcare ecosystem. A patient group advisory council was established to provide a patient perspective to DIA's patient engagement strategies. In 2016, together with Tufts University, we spearheaded a collaborative multi-phase research project to gain insights into patient-centric initiative in drug development and their impact on health outcomes. The results were officially released in January 2017 and show that when patients were involved, clinical trial performance improved, study volunteers felt more engaged, and costs were reduced across the long-term drug development portfolio. In recent years, patient partnership in, 
healthcare product development have flourished and as a direct result of the confidence and sense of autonomy patients have gained. To drive this positive movement forward, we are now collaborating with more than 30 patient-focused organizations via the International Leadership Group of the new Innovative Medicines Initiative paradigm. DIA convened patients, policymakers, regulators, HTAs, industry representatives, academia, and researchers together to share discuss and collaborate at all our meetings across the globe. Less than a month ago, a number of you participated in DIA Europe 2018 in Basel. Next month, we will host a global rare disease town hall in Boston where some of you will be speaking. In the meantime, we would like to work with you on the next European annual meeting, which will happen here in Vienna. We aspire for the patient voice and perspective to be present throughout the whole program in the meeting. The purpose of orphan medicines is to improve and often save patient lives. Therefore, patients should be at the center of the drug development life cycle. It is through meetings and discussions like today and tomorrow, rare diseases, 360 degrees, we aspire to partner with you in efforts to agreeing on collaborative strategies that catalyze action and ensure we leave no one behind. Thank you for partnering with DIA and have a wonderful conference. Thank you, Magdalena, and I can only repeat that we are so happy to have been collaborating on different fellowship programs, UPT, many things over the years, and this conference, of course. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Anna Rath. Uh, Anna Rath uh, is known to most of you as uh, acting director of Orphanence since uh, May 2014, but uh, Anna has worked with Orphanence, I think, since 2005. And uh, Anna is involved in so many aspects of uh, rare diseases, uh, the orphanate rare disease ontology, just to mention one, or the scientific secretary of the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, and I could continue for hours, so I don't. So, Anna, please. So, hello everybody, and thank you, Terkel, thank you, Jan, and Magdalena, uh, it's a honor for Orphanet to co-organize for the first time uh, the European Red Disease Conference this year. A huge conference because I just knew that more than 900 attendees are here, so it's very, very an impressive uh, success. What is special in the rare disease field is the multiplicity and the richness of competencies, backgrounds, universities committed to it. The rare disease community has proven many times its intrinsic capacity to bring different worlds together. And not to go very far back in time, there was the USERT and the Commission Expert Group of Rare Diseases Forum, allowing for national and transnational health policymakers to discuss together, but also with the patients, uh, industry, regulators, and academia. In the last three years, the member states joint action for rare diseases are the action that I have the pleasure and the responsibility to coordinate. Um, I has succeeded the cross-fertilization of the data and information field in one side and the policy field in the other side with major achievements. Uh, like um, the improvement and expansion of the orphanage services for end users, the ways to uh, implement a specific codification in order to make rare disease patients visible in health information systems, and the advent and the support of European reference networks and EPACs a year ago. 
ERNs are building the ground for the future of the rare disease field in Europe, for they are one of the European endeavors that are really structuring the rare disease field. Others are Eurordis for patient advocacy, Orphanet for information and the nomenclature of rare diseases, and the hopefully next to come European Joint Co-Fund Program for Rare Disease Research. These four initiatives are already working consistently together, making Europe a strongly structured space for rare disease cause to be heard. But the field is becoming the more and more structured also at the global level. Not only orphanet becomes global, but patients organize themselves across the, the globe through Rare Disease International. Research funders, patients, industry, and academia uh, are structured through the IRDIRC for a better and faster research. Rare disease patients that do not have a diagnosis yet can benefit for the undiagnosed uh, 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 international network across continents. And all these achievements structure the rare disease field at the global level. But that being said, how we solved all the problems so far? Are we really done? Has every person with a rare disease a solution? The same chances, equalitarian access to the best care, to the citizens' rights? The answer is in the question. The answer is not yet. However, all the building blocks are there. Expertise is there, technology is there. We have common standardized vocabularies to describe and to, next, to exchange data. We have recommendations in so many fields. There are incentives to develop therapies, to conduct research, and so many different people committed to rare diseases. It seems that we have no excuses to left any rare disease patient behind. That is why we are now here today, to identify what is left to be done, where the problems are, and to imagine solutions. In my humble opinion, and without having the pretension to cover everything, we should look at both ends of the spectrum the local, the very local level, so at the closest proximity of patients' lives, and the global level, meaning all the countries and continents that are not really picking the profits of what the developed world has already achieved. So locally, make rare disease patients be correctly uh, detected and brought to the expertise giving a solution even before giving a diagnosis, making healthcare and social care systems work together. We need to find and to invent local solutions that we can export and adapt to those countries and continents somehow left aside. We need to reinforce national, European, and international cross-talking between decision makers and for that, we need places in the WHO, in the United Nations, and in Europe to ensure prevention of avo avoidable burden and suffering for rare disease patients and promotion of quality of life and equality of access to the better diagnosis, therapies, and global care. So let's find ways during this conference to address both local and global level at the same time. Thank you very much and have an exciting conference. Thank you so much, Anna. <clears throat> the next speaker is our co-host, or the host of the conference, uh, Rainer Riedel, who is the founder and president of Porare Austria. Uh, which is the Austrian Alliance for Rare Diseases. Uh, Rainer Riedel is the father of a 24-year-old uh, daughter, who I think is here, uh, with uh, Epidermolosis bullosa, um, founder of the uh, Epidermolosis bullosa uh, Austria uh, from in 95, 
quite a few years back, uh, and uh, acting president also of uh, this association. Uh, so you have been involved with rare diseases on many levels for quite many years. Right now. Good morning and welcome. It was about five years ago when I and my fellow rare disease combatants uh, at ProRare, the Austrian Alliance for Rare Diseases, thought about proposing Vienna as a possible venue for the ECRD 2018. Although it, is, it has been hard work for many people, it seems only a moment later that here we are. The European Conference on Rare Diseases and Orphan Products 2018 has just opened here, right in the center of Europe. I'm very proud that we were able to persuade the organizers in Eurodis to consider Vienna. I'm convinced that this city, with its international outlook and, in, and, in, and institutions of learning and research, together with its medical, scientific, and artistic, artistic legacy, is an inspirational place for us all to come together to discuss the issues important in fighting rare diseases. I hope that we will learn from each other and generate new ideas and opportunities whereby patient advocates and other stakeholders in this country and elsewhere can focus their efforts to benefit people who live with a rare condition. So yes, this is a very special moment for me. As a father of a 24-year-old daughter with epidermolysis bullosa, which is a rare skin disorder, I and my whole family have experienced what it means to live with such a condition. Together we had to face her blisters, wounds, and massive pain, and the necessity for wound and pain management every single day. We had to accept that there, were no, that there was no knowledge of the condition or expertise in clinical care. We had to fight to get bandages and pain relief reimbursed, and we had to wait for an accurate, exact, uh, exact genetic diagnosis for more than 13 years. And even then we learned that there's no cure, not even an effective approach to alleviate her distressing symptoms. Our way of dealing with the situation was to take action ourselves. 16 years ago, we started with a big dream to build a special clinic to create a center for clinical expertise for patients with epidermolysis bullosa. It took four years of hard work, planning, PR, fundraising, thoughts about the governance to go from the idea to a place we could make use of that would address not only our daughter's needs, but those of all people with EB and give hope to them and their families for future effective treatments. We opened the so-called EB House Austria in 2005, and it includes an outpatient unit, research facilities, a clinical study center, and an, an academy to teach patients and clinical staff about the disease. We even started EB Clinet, a network of EB centers and, and EB experts, which now has about 90 partners in, in nearly 60 countries around the globe. The EP House was founded and is still maintained by the patient organization Deborah Austria and is, for the most part, funded by private donations. Last year it was certified as Austria's first center for rare diseases and it is now one of many centers of expertise in the collaborative Earn Skin. We have come a long way in, this, in just 12 years and the EP House now is a site engaged in multiple international clinical trials of EP therapies. I tell this story because I hope that it will inspire others who face similar, seemingly unsurmountable challenges. It shows what can be achieved by patients and their networks if they have a declared mission, clear goals, and an enormous amount of dedication and persistence refusing to, to be discouraged by difficulties. Having summarized my own, st my, my own story in a nutshell, I'm very glad that this, not, that this is not the only success story. Amongst the 60 or so members of ProRare Austria, there are many patient, patient groups who achieve wonderful things. We see patients organizing themselves, we see patient support groups who bring together doctors and nurses to improve clinical care, we see groups who start initiative, in, initiatives to support research into cures or better symptom relief, and we see groups who are well established and benefit from their international connections. In all these cases, there is one key success factor, networking. Networking on different levels and among all the various stakeholders, patients, clinicians, researchers, payers, and so on, 
together with partners from the biopharma and healthcare industry. The ECRD is a format where it all, all comes together, where all stakeholders meet to determine the next critical steps needed to make our dreams happen. The six themes, the 30 sessions, the lots of presentations and many side meetings of the ECRD show the broad variety of issues we want and need to discuss. For the conference, I would ask each and every one of you to both learn and teach. Each of us brings our own very important perspective uh, uh, and expertise, whether as some, someone with a rare disease, a clinician, a researcher from academia or industry, or someone who is engaged in development of social or healthcare policy that will ensure pa that patients receive new treatments and the best healthcare possible. We need to share our knowledge and experience to ensure that the decisions and actions are based on the full, fullest and most accurate information available, taking all perspectives, in, perspectives into account. Speak up, challenge ideas, and propose your own. There is still a great variety of challenges we all see. May they be in medical care, social care, research, clinical studies, partnering with industry, access to and reimbursement of drugs and therapies once they become available. On the one hand, we share many of these challenges. On the other hand, every patient group and every country will have its own specific challenges created by available resources, healthcare structures and provisions, and socio-political attitudes. One of the big issues for pro-rare pro Austria is our national plan for rare diseases. In my opinion, it was structured absolutely correctly, engaging all relevant stakeholders and thus making sure that there is a broad consensus on what is needed and in which order things need to be implemented. It took several years to develop the plan with its 82 projects. As it was called a five-year plan, it was sponsored by the Austrian Ministry of Health. We hope to kick off and finish most of these projects between 2014 and 2018. As with many long-term plans, reality shows that we are far too optimistic on timelines. Yes, we have defined the right projects. Yes, we have put them into the right order. But no, this exercise will take much, much longer than planned and expected. So again, we will need patience, energy, doggedness to get where we need to go. However, it's good to be ambitious and push ourselves to meet the challenge. I'm convinced that this conference will inspire us to achieve exac exactly that. So please make the most of this opportunity to meet interesting people, exchange ideas, and uh, through those interactions create new ideas. I hope this conference will then also provide you with fresh energy and enthusiasm to make those ideas rea reality and accomplish your personal goals. Enjoy your time here in Vienna, and I wish you all two inspiring days, networking hard and having fun. Thank you. <clears throat> so now it's my pleasure to announce the next speaker, Dr. Magdalena Aruas. Ms. Aruas holds a doctoral degree in medicine and is the acting director for public health and medical affairs in the Austrian Ministry of Health. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to wish you a very warm welcome in Vienna at the ninth European Conference on Rare Diseases and Orphan Products. The organizer, Eurodis Rare Diseases uh, Europe, entitled this conference, Rare Diseases 360 Degrees, Collaborative Strategies to Leave No One Behind. And I think this is a very good title. In the last few years, the research and diagnosis landscape has changed significantly in the field of rare diseases. Integration of new technologies in healthcare and, it, and increased connection between research and care has opened up new possibilities for faster diagnosis and treatment. Central questions are how we can exploit current achievements in genomics, how to prepare for new developments on the horizon, and how to ensure no patients are left behind. In the European Union, rare diseases are defined in terms of their frequency. A disease or disorder is considered to be rare when on any one particular day, 
fewer than five in 10,000 people living in the EU are affected by it. The umbrella term covers an estimated 6,000 to 8,000 different rare diseases, which together may affect 6 to 8 percent of Europe's population. This to show you uh, the dimensions of rare diseases. Based on these figures, it is safe to assume that around half a million patients in Austria are suffering from rare conditions. As the individual disorders are far from common, patients and their relatives are often faced with particularly problematic situations. The National Action Plan for Rare Diseases, you already heard about it by Rainer Riedel, should help improve medical care for those affected. At the same time, doctors other health professionals and society in la at large should become more aware of the special needs of people who are affected by rare diseases. Commissioned by the Federal Ministry of Health and adopted in 2015, the National Action Plan was compiled by the National Coordination Center for Rare Diseases in conjunction with the expert group on rare diseases and the strategic platform for rare diseases. In 2014, an advisory panel on rare diseases was established to replace the expert group as a permanent consultative body. The action plan has defined nine priorities in line with European recommendations, but also taking national requirements into consideration. These include, amongst others, representing rare diseases in Austria's healthcare and social welfare system, promoting research and improving access to treatment. When the action plan was drawn up, the end of 2018 was set as the time frame for implementing the measures, as several of them foresaw the implementation of permanent structures, such as advisory boards, the National Action Plan for Rare Diseases, will continue to pursue its goals beyond the end of 2018, of course. An important aspect of the National Action Plan's work is the official designation of centers of expertise, coupled with networking within the European Union. At present, 31 departments have been identified as potential centers of expertise. Our joint goal, goal is to pool European expertise in order to ensure the best possible care for patients with rare diseases and disorders in Europe. Data science can contribute to personalized medical treatments. So innovation has to be managed on the national and international level. On national level, for me, it is important that we keep on to discuss with all stakeholders and those who have to decide on the patient's uh, level two. The key issues facing people living with a rare disease and also health system is the need for a diagnosis. Without a early diagnosis, families and the, and the clinicians who support them are in the dark and possibly missing out on interventions that might improve the situation. There is a need for policy that protects and assists clinicians in sharing information to help patients achieve a diagnosis through cross-border and international efforts. Furthermore, it helps health systems better manage rare diseases. Acknowledging the patient as a key actor on their own health and putting them at the center is essential. There are great advances in clinical genetic diagnosis and in technologies. But despite these innovations, there are still patients their condition is likely to remain undiagnosed. Rare diseases pose serious health, social and everyday challenges, which significantly affect the autonomy and the fundamental human rights. However, people living with rare diseases and their carers should be recognized and esteemed as persons, not as diagnosis. They should have the possibility of living a life with fulfilling personal relationships, of being able to contribute meaningfully to the lives of others and to society. Freedom to decide on their own lives, 
autonomy, security and dignity are important factors of what we call quality of life. Health and social systems <coughs> have to enforce inclusion and participation in society. The diagnosis and treatment of rare diseases can only be addressed through collaboration across disciplinary, institutional and national boundaries. No nation can go it alone in providing an across-the-board diagnostic service for rare diseases, uh, much less deliver comprehensive and integrated care based on current scientific understanding and clinical best practice. There has to be a worldwide approach. The vision is a world where all pe people living with rare diseases receive equitable treatment and support, and all advances in rare diseases benefit all those affected, regardless of where they live. The medicine of the future <coughs> will be based on the P4 pillars, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. We are facing a digital transformation in healthcare. New technology will create fabulous opportunities, especially for patients with rare diseases. Information and awareness are elements crucial to understand in order to mitigate the risks while we are evolving into a new era of medicine. A lot of scientific, clinical, societal, ethical and practical questions that surround the issue as well as to debate the best way of adopting these new technologi technological developments. There is also a need to develop precision public health policy frameworks within which the technolo technological developments and information flowing from precision medicines initiatives can be supported and translated into public health systems. Over the course of the past 15 years, since the adoption of the EU regulation on orphan medicinal products, the rules and cycles for drug development, authorization and access have changed. Regulatory systems are trying to keep up with these changes and apply flexibility, in particular for rare diseases. The risks inherent to such a different approach are high as standards of regulatory decisions can not be lowered. Therefore, multi-stakeholder collaboration is key, as well as high levels of engagement and responsibility. There is an intensive way of approaching early access with multiple initiatives by and around European Medicines Agency and various health technology assessment agencies. But payers are not yet incorporated, but they are also rapidly becoming more aware of challenges around uh, access and sustainability and are discovering the added value of collaboration in different fields such as um, horizon scanning, use of the joint HDA reports, information sharing and joint negotiations. The European Medicines Agency and Health Technology uh, assessors work together to scan the horizon and to see which medicines are likely to fit their respective procedures. This is preparing for future European cooperation on health technology assessors as a permanent scientific secretariat to host European health technology assessors activity is needed. The current cooperation on health technology assessors will be on the top of the agenda of the Euro Austrian Presidency of the Council of the European Union, which will start in a few weeks ahead from today. So, coming to the end, um, I wish you an, a very interesting conference, fruitful discussions and exchanges, and enjoy your stay here in Vienna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena Darwas. Many of you met uh, Commissioner Andrew Kaitis uh, last year in Lithuania at the launch of the European Reference Networks. And I think no one was in doubt that he is very passionate about this project 
as he's passionate about improving the conditions for people living with rare diseases. Unfortunately, uh, he could not be with us today, but he has sent a video message uh, that will be displayed now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I cannot be with you today in person, but I am glad to have this opportunity to address the ninth European Conference on Rare Diseases. Let me start by thanking you all for your hard work, commitment, and dedication. You are the true game changers, bringing difference to the lives of those suffering from rare diseases. Your support is vital towards our common aim of improving the quality of life of millions of patients and their families in Europe. When I am asked to speak about rare diseases, I cannot help but to focus a lot on European Reference Network. That is, for me, the prime example of how common efforts in the area of health can lead to a real European success story. Patients' organizations, and in particular, Eurodis, have been key actors and partners in setting up the European Reference Networks system. So once again, thank you for all the work you have done and that you continue to do in this field where collaboration at EU level plays an important role in terms of effectiveness and efficiency. Eurodis has been always a key interlocutor and partner in this implementation process as a partner in the European Joint Action on Rare Diseases. By providing the patient insights through its participation in the former Commission Expert Group on Rare Diseases and through its commitment in setting up the European Reference Network's governance model to ensure the voice of the patients is heard, identifying their needs and expectations. The clinical patient management system, the IT platform provided by the Commission, is now running and enabling members of European Reference Network to set up virtual panels to discuss complex patient cases and to solve the main issue, the fragmentation of relevant knowledge and expertise in the field. In a few months, more than 100 patient cases have already been discussed by the European Reference Network using this facility. Early days, of course, but nevertheless, a most promising start. Now that the framework is in place and the European Reference Networks are up and running, we need to focus on how to maximize their effectiveness and how to ensure their sustainability. We need also to introduce research on new ways to diagnose rare diseases and to treat patients into the everyday work of the European Reference Networks. I am a true believer that European Reference Networks can act as a stepping stone toward bigger networks of research, such as the European High Performance Computing and the European Research Infrastructures. European Reference Networks are at a pivotal place in facilitating large clinical studies to improve understanding of diseases, support development of new care models, and innovative medical solutions. Imagine what a European success it could become. It is foreseen that European Reference Network could be used toward building a European health data ecosystem and initiating better networking between and within member states' healthcare systems. Already, and I am excited to say that in April, 13 EU countries signed a declaration for delivering cross-border access to genomic information. The sharing of genomic data can only improve understanding and prevention of disease, enabling for more personalized treatments, which is of particular relevance and importance to rare diseases. Along with this development, I want to highlight some additional progress. Firstly, the Commission continues to remain active at technical, strategic and political levels to ensure the integration of European reference networks into national healthcare systems. 
Also, the Commission will launch a new call towards the end of the year for highly specialized centers not included in the first approved networks to apply to participate in the work of approved European reference networks. This will ensure new knowledge is acquired to complement existing European reference networks and also increase geographical coverage to enable patients to have more access to European reference networks in their own country. Through our new steering group on health promotion and disease prevention, we will continue to support cooperation at EU level on the codification of rare diseases through the OFRA codes project. In parallel, we will continue to collect best practices and the, to support registries for rare diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that I have personally met a number of you already, and I know you remain focused on the central goals of this project to increase the likelihood of early and accurate diagnosis and effective treatment of European patients suffering from rare diseases. Thanks for the good work you do. I wish you all an enjoyable and productive conference. The last speaker of this session is uh, Martin Cheshel. Um, Martin Cheshel is uh, Deputy Director General for Health and uh, in the Health and Food Safety Director General. Welcome to. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today in Vienna, one of the great European cities that represents in so many ways all the values of Europe, the heritage and the beauty of Europe. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity to also, um, first of all, tell you something about ongoing developments in the area of rare diseases, but also more importantly to listen to what you have to say. Um, it is a key moment, um, not just for rare disease policy, but for health policy in general, and I would say for all aspects of European policy. Um, as we shape the years ahead. And therefore, um, I am very eager to hear to what, you, what you have to say. Um, as you all know, all too well, um, rare disease patients struggle every day with several problems. Some of those are health problems, but not just health problems. Um, what is, I think, clear to all of us, and this is the main reason why we are all here, is that many of these rare conditions are simply too rare for individual countries to have all the necessary expertise needed to diagnose and treat them. That is the starting point. No country alone has the knowledge and capacity to treat all rare and complex diseases. So the added value of cooperation at European level, I think, is very self-evident. As the Commissioner has just mentioned, um, the past few years in particular, um, have been characterized by a strong work in the setting up of the European reference networks, um, precisely with this added value in mind. The European reference networks can help solve the problem I have just mentioned by pooling expertise from different EU countries. They offer great European added value in giving patients and doctors access to the best expertise and the timely exchange of life-saving knowledge. Many of you, of course, are already aware of their existence and their vast potential, both in the clinical and in the research areas. But allow me to quickly paint the general picture of this project. Um, it's still very early days, as the Commissioner mentioned. The first ERNs were launched exactly a year ago. And today, we already have 24 thriving networks, which include more than 900 healthcare units of 313 hospitals from 26 countries. So it's a good start, but it's a start. I'm proud to say as well that the ERN's clinical patient management system, the IT platform, which enables the virtual consultations was launched in November last year. And more than 100 consultation panels have already been opened, which means that the first patients with complex diseases and often uncertain diagnosis are directly benefiting from European cooperation as we speak. But it would be a mistake 
to view ERNs as just a tool of last resort to be used when we run out of options. This is just the beginning. The potential is much, much greater. If we look at the great need there is to generate knowledge and to share knowledge by generating a pool of patient data, the ERNs are very well placed to facilitate large clinical studies to improve the understanding of diseases and to support the development of new products. I am happy to see that there is already a strong feeling of trust and ownership for the ERN model. This is absolutely essential, crucial, to get the networks up and running. So we, we invested, together with all of you, a lot of effort in this. Once we have achieved this, we then need to use all the tools available to ensure that those networks are sustainable. This is the next challenge. We need to ensure that the ERNs are not just up and running, but that we finalize the fine tuning, which of course is still ongoing, but also uh, to maximize their effectiveness and ensure, as I said, their long-term sustainability. And now is the time to work together. National uh, authorities, patient organizations, healthcare providers, professionals, the commission, to make sure ERNs become a permanent and thriving reality and a true success for European patients. But ERNs do not just exist in isolation. They, have, they of course, are linked to the wider issue of what is our rare disease policy. And here I would like to take the opportunity to thank Eurordis in particular for its active engagement in bringing rare disease patients to the center of EU policy making. Um, I encourage you to make use of the health policy platform, which we have just established some months ago, with the specific aim of involving stakeholders concerned by specific issues to develop common positions. In our Directorate General, Directorate General for Health and Food Safety, we are very aware of the immense expertise that our stakeholders have, and we have um, purposely put in place this platform to enable you to directly provide input into our own policy making, give us your ideas and also your criticism, if necessary, of course, um, when you think that we should be addressing certain issues more vigorously. I would like to invite you to submit your ideas and best practices on rare diseases via the new EU best practice portal. These, these um, proposals, these uh, examples will be evaluated and possibly selected by the steering group that the commissioner was just referring to. Um, I would like to stress that rare diseases are part of the steering group's area of work. And therefore, if the steering group selects best practices on rare diseases, they will be implemented by using the health program or other funding mechanisms. We are very much focused at the moment and in the coming months and years on implementation. It's not enough to generate best practices. We are very good at that, but we also need to ensure that best practices become standard practices everywhere across Europe, not just in the best performing regions. Uh, and therefore, we need to use the instruments, the powerful instruments that we have, financial, policy, but also our convening power and others, to make sure that we can help with implementation. And this is the main reason why we are investing so heavily in this steering group. To give you a concrete example, already last year, the steering group selected the codification of rare diseases as a best practice, and therefore, a specific project called Orpha Codes will now be supported with a budget of 750,000 euros under the EU health program this year. But we, of course, have access to other programs as well. Um, and um, I would like to invite you once again to give us your ideas of what best practices um, we should prioritize for implementation. In the area of research, um, our Director General has a close collaboration with the Director General for Research and with the Joint Research Center on research activities, information and registration, and also on the collection of best practices on rare diseases. It is also important to note that activities on registries for rare diseases will continue to be supported through the Commission's Joint Research Center and activities on research into rare diseases will continue to be supported through the research program, and I will say something about that later. And finally, activities on the reference networks on rare diseases, as I said, will be supported and consolidated. It is, 
I'm sure we all agree, our common ambition to ensure that the European regulatory environment delivers and keeps on delivering on patient-driven innovation. As you know, another major area of work at the moment is the ongoing discussion about how to reconcile, on the one hand, the need to have innovation and to stimulate and incentivize innovation, which is one imperative. The other imperative is to ensure that everyone can benefit from that innovation, which means also the sustainability of health systems and, of course, access to medicines. It is a very difficult balance. I am sure you are aware of that. Um, and this is precisely one of the main areas of work at the moment. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that pharmaceutical incentives, such as patent protection and market exclusivity, play an important role in attracting investment and fostering innovation, particularly in areas where the business model is placed under immense challenge, such as the, the, the area of orphan medicinal products, which is a very small sector uh, by definition. But there is an equally important challenge, which is to find as well the appropriate balance between the adequate incentives for research and development and balance that with equitable access to medicines for all and with the sustainability of health systems. We cannot have one without the other. These are all uh, important aspects of this essential triangle. And we cannot address this challenge without having a good knowledge base, first and foremost. The biggest risk in this whole discussion is that we begin the debate without having the facts in front of us. And the European Commission is therefore working on studying the impact of the various incentives on innovation and access as was requested by the Council in 2016. This is a debate which will start in earnest very soon once we have completed our um, assessment of the situation. Um, but I would like here to emphasize it's very important that we enter this debate in the right spirit. We should be debating to find solutions, not to score points and underline well-known, well-understood pre-existing positions. I say this because on the one hand there is a great potential that this debate could help us find the way forward for the coming years. There's also the risk it could become a toxic debate um, where we all just basically um, repeat uh, slogans to each other and that's not very constructive. We're also um, at work to construct other tools where the added value uh, is very high. Um, and I would like to mention one example, which is health technology assessment. This is, we believe, an excellent opportunity for member states to pool their expertise, once again, and use this very powerful tool, which has become absolutely a key tool in the policymaker's arsenal, to assess in an evidence-based manner the relative clinical effectiveness of medicinal products and, indeed, of other medical technologies as well. We have had more than 20 years of cooperation in this area. It was a very thorough preparation. But the cooperation has been based on projects, has been driven by projects, and projects have a beginning and an end. And with this in mind, the Commission asked a very basic question. Where do we go after 2020 when the current project, the UNETA cooperation on HDA, ends? Uh, we cannot have open-ended projects on a permanent basis. That is not possible. And with this in mind, the Commission, having looked at all the evidence and experience, adopted a proposal in January for a more sustainable European approach to health technology assessment. The envisaged system will be member state driven. It will be member states who will not only carry out the work, but also decide on the priorities. And this in itself, by the way, would send a very powerful and clear signal of what is really a priority for member states. The national HDA authorities would jointly develop outputs and the Commission would play a supporting role, as is our responsibility. It is important to stress as well that the joint clinical assessments will be just that. They will be limited to scientific assessments and that appraisal remains at national level. We felt that this was the best balance between ensuring that there was no duplication, for example, of clinical work, but at the same time recognizing that member states are different and that they may have different conditions to take into account when they make their final decisions. Any subsequent economic assessment and appraisal of cost effectiveness will also remain at national level because this is much more context specific. 
We are also proposing the mandatory use of joint clinical assessments, and this implies that member states would use the joint clinical assessments in their national HDA process in the same way as the equivalent national documents are currently used. It does not in any way prescribe any particular decision. It simply means there should be no duplication of assessments. Unfortunately, while we have learned a lot from the UNETA process, there have been cases where the joint work has been done, everybody said they were very happy with the joint work, they went back home and did it all over again. This is not very good use of taxpayers' money, I think you would all agree. Um, if we decide on the priorities and we decide on the methodologies, and when we say we as the member states, then of course the decisions, uh, the, the output should be used. And that's the question of appraisal. The HTA legislative proposal, particularly, I believe, responds very well to the needs in relation to rare diseases and orphan products, where there is an even greater need to pool resources, data, and expertise to facilitate access to innovative technologies. In particular, this would allow member state health systems, all of them, not just some of them, to have the best information available for decision making. It would offer increased business predictability for health technology developers and facilitate, therefore, faster access for patients. Another key issue um, where the European Commission has been very much at work uh, in the past months is the issue of data and health data in particular. Um, we all recognize, I think, the importance, the growing importance of data and we're also aware of the fact that whereas health systems generate an enormous amount of data, only a very, very small fraction of that is actually used systematically to benefit patients, to advance public health, and to support health systems. We waste most of it, let's be very honest. Um, and with this in mind, the Commission has recently um, issued a communication on the digital transformation of health and care, which outlines three basic principles. First, as individuals, as patients, as citizens, we should have access at all times to our health data and personal health records should be there, they should be standardized and they should be interoperable and we should have access to them irrespective of our physical location. This is a may appear to be a very basic building block but it's, it's not generally the case in most, in most the countries. The second pillar of this communication is the research angle. We believe that data is the resource that will actually help unlock a lot of issues, a lot of questions that today remain um, unanswered, particularly in less well understood um, cases such as rare diseases. The answer is probably there, but it's hidden in a huge mountain of data um, and we need to have much better systems to use it and uh, interrogate that data. Um, the Commission, for example, has proposed uh, a one million genome project that would uh, create a European pool of genome data uh, that could be very useful, we believe, to advance research. Other jurisdictions have this. We should have it in Europe as well, not simply to compete, but also because we need it. Um, it is a precondition uh, for research. And the third pillar of this communication is to finally use the technology to achieve something we've been talking about for many, many years, but which we've not been able to achieve, is to move to a patient-centered model. Technology today allows us to do things like remote monitoring of patients, supporting frontline professionals uh, in a much better way. We, we don't have to have a hospital-centered system anymore because the technology will allow us to link the hospital with the patient, with the carers, with the professionals. Uh, but we need also to have the right investments in place. Now, before I conclude, I come to, to use the phrase, you know, the million dollar question. Maybe it's a million euro question, maybe even much more. How do you make all this happen? It's obviously the funding. Um, and here again, the Commission has been working very hard. Uh, as you know, on the 2nd of May, the Commission published its proposal for the EU budget 2021 to 2027. So it is uh, a substantial perspective. And I'm very glad to announce that this proposal includes major announcements from the perspective of health policy in general and specifically for rare diseases. Starting with the current health program, I know it was a question many of you asked, what will happen to the health program? 
uh, there were many concerns voiced in that regard. Well, the current health program will first of all be incorporated into the European Social Fund Plus, recognizing politically the, the importance that health plays as the key, the cornerstone of our social model in Europe, something which really characterizes Europe like very few other things. It will also receive more money than before when you consider that there will be 27 member states in this budgetary period. The budget will be 413 million euros. So for 27, that is uh, an increase in real terms. If you look at the research program, in investment in research and innovation will increase by 50%. It will reach 100 billion euros for Horizon Europe and innovation. So whereas we are in an environment of severe constraints on our budget, particularly in a post-Brexit scenario, the European Commission took a very clear decision to invest even more strongly in research. And not just the Digital Europe program, which will be a new program, um, and the Connecting Europe Facility Digital, linked with that, will receive a nine-fold increase to 12 billion euros. And this program will be mainly intended to roll out digital solutions in member states and regions across Europe to develop the digital infrastructure. And health needs that infrastructure more than many other sectors that we strongly believe. And this is also very good news for the ERNs, which are, of course, a digital network at heart and are at the forefront of connecting Europe in the area of health. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a small sample of what we are doing. There are many, many other aspects uh, which, of course, are also relevant. But the key question is, where do we go from here? Because these are all building blocks. And blocks are important, but they need to be joined together to form a construction. And this is the next stage in our work. I believe we have come at that stage. And if I were to underline the one key challenge is that we need to combine all these blocks, not just at the European level. More importantly is how these blocks are combined and used at all levels, European, national, regional, local level. Because it's only if we find the best way to do that that we'll be able to really help patients. Patients are always the same. And some things can be done at European level to support them, others have to be done at national, regional, or local level. And it's only by joining efforts that we can actually deliver the best care for our patients and our citizens. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussions today. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Sanchez. <clears throat> we all look very much forward to the impact study, we, but the impact study, as you said, is just an instrument to design the future. And I'm sure that everybody here is eager also to contribute to designing the future, and you will through the discussions of the next two days. So uh, thank you to all the speakers of this morning's session. We are running a little bit late, so we will postpone the start of the next session till 10.30. So please grab a cup of coffee. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to welcome you all today and to join many beautiful words which were addressed this morning. Well, who could disagree? Uh, a significant work has been done in order to raise awareness in rare diseases, in order to bring all the stakeholders together to join their energy, to join their intellectual curiosity, academic passion to join their excellence and knowledge to correspond the needs of patients. Well, the topics which we are going to cover and limit us in terms of geography, in terms of markets, in terms of economy, in terms of trends and technologies. We are turning 360 degrees to emphasize the integrity of healthcare into uh, factors which are driving our everyday life. We are choosing this radius to show that we are not going to compromise fragmentation and exclusion. I hope and wish that we will have 
really interesting time together during the rest of a plenary session today and very interesting simultaneous running session, theme sessions during uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. When we say together, we mean you all here in wonderful Vienna engaged as, as well as our online audience. So for these purposes, for getting everyone together, we are using an interactive tool, Slido, which will enable you to ask questions to the speakers and to participate in the polls during the session and some of the, and, 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 and some of the theme sessions as well. So if you, if you wish to do so, which is really highly recommended, so you should go, as long as you are registered to the Wi-Fi, you should go to slido.com, enter yourself with hashtag ECRD, and then you can uh, choose a plenary session and there will be, where you will be ask, asked questions from our side. So just to satisfy our curiosity and to warm up, we have prepared several questions for you. And first, uh, first of them, the first thing we would like to know about yourself is what your favorite color is. So I invite everyone to vote. You have many options. Oh, I see blue and red. Okay, and others. Now when you will see the result instantly. One, two, three, we stop voting. And we, we see that the most favorite color of our participants is blue. It seems good, it seems promising. The second question is really simple and used not for purposes of intelligent or other kind of issues is what uh, stakeholder group are you representing today? Okay, one, two, three, we're stopping the voting and we see that we have the, the, the big majority of patient, patient advocates and volunteers and other representatives here today. So it's very important to have a discussion to hear what everyone has, has to say as it was mentioned previously. And we have a third question. What are your primary expectations? What intentions took you here? What dialogues, what dialogues and what valuable partnerships would you like to benefit from, from this conference? Um, and while, while you're voting, so I would also like to encourage you to feel free and to use the mobile application, which is dedicated to this conference. Um, and uh, you can upload photo photos, you can explore the bios of speakers, uh, you can plan your agenda, you can check into events, and, and, and use the mobile apps, which is really convenient and at your disposal. And we also encourage not to leave your friends and colleagues behind, and please use hashtag ECRD uh, and, 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 and to show off what you have to show uh, out of this event to your colleagues and friends via social media. And now we're stopped voting. One, two, three, yes. Absolutely, I, I would have chosen that myself as well. To trigger new opportunities to develop chart. Wow, wow, everything's changing instantly. <laughs> You'll never know. Well, yes, we're stopping the voting. And it appears that people would love to increase understanding of health policy framework for rare diseases and upcoming issues. So it's, it's really important and it's really good that we as, 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 as a program committee were really focused on policy frameworks which are actu actually relevant for all stakeholders who are participating here today. So thank you very much. Feel yourself comfortable, feel yourself involved and engaged and, and be active users of our interactive tools today. Um, 
I would be delighted to announce our next prominent speaker, Dr. Rudiger Krech, who is a director of universal health coverage and health systems at WHO. Uh, but unfortunately, he could not be present here today with us due to important personal reasons. So uh, I'm more than happy to forward his warm welcome to all you here and to online audience as well and to give his warm address and to read his speech. Your Excellences, dear Mr. Seychelles, dear Jan and Paloma, the vision of sustainable development goals is a world in which no one is left behind, including people who suffer from rare diseases. Just because a disease affects a small number of people does not make it irrelevant or less important than diseases that affect millions. This is a quote that shall be the basis of my speech today. It comes from WHO's Director General, Dr. Tedos. With 300 from 350 millions of people affected worldwide and more than 7,000 different types of diseases, known to date, rare diseases represent a major challenge in public health that has been largely ignored. Consequently, this is a field in public health and research that would certainly benefit from globally concerted action and international collaboration. Why, we may ask, rare disease largely ignored? While I will not even try to give a comprehensive answer, I'd rather want to highlight some dimensions and offer some questions that might inspire our debate. Conrad Lawrence, one of the founding fathers of the field of etiology, has said that every researcher gets a narrower and narrower field of knowledge in which he, and I might add she, must be an expert in order to compete with other people. The specialist knows more and more about less and less. As the body of scientific knowledge in discipline increases, there is a pressure for specialization. Scientific specialization has been hugely successful in the area or of identifying rare diseases, but it has also led to isolation as well as poor visibility and public attention. Viewing rare diseases through a global public health lens offers a different perspective. Rare diseases patients and their families are a particularly vulnerable group of citizens who experience scarcity of medical knowledge, difficulties in accessing adequate care, as well as isolation from society due to the rarity of their condition and the scattered expertise. In general, health systems are not adapted to rare diseases and there is a little public health policy to respond to their specific needs, access to quality health care, overall social and medical support, effective liaison between hospitals and general practices, as well as professional and social integration, autonomy and independence. Universal health coverage means that all people and communities receive the promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative health services they need or sufficient quality to be effective, while also ensuring that the use of these services does not expose a user to financial hardship. Health systems can learn a lot from rare diseases to design systems that are fit for the future and effectively contributing to universal health coverage. Rarity calls for increased international mobility of experts as well as of patients, as the most clinically relevant expertise will most likely not be available locally. Will innovative solutions in E and M health be able to pool expertise and develop virtual centers of expertise? Could they help to create expert structures for management and care of rare diseases, uh, disease patients, and bring together multidisciplinary competencies and skills in order to serve a specific medical rehabilitative and palliative needs of rare disease patients? Could accredited global centers of excellence help to provide best quality care based on available clinical evidence? Would we be able to globally find innovative ways of financing such centers? 
so that patients and their families will not fall into poverty because of out-of-pocket payments related to, to care for rare, their rare diseases. Pooling seems to be one of the magic words when it comes to rare diseases. It helps to, to bring together the critical mass and balance low prevalence and incidence. It helps to focus the diffuse shadow light in which rare diseases are currently barely seen and create spotlights. Pooling of research and development, pooling data, pooling healthcare facilities, and pooling of experts. Lots of excellent work has been undertaken in recent years in this regard. The launching of European reference networks is one of such initiatives. Could pooling also serve to bring in expertise from Japan, Australia, Canada, China? A second word that comes is collaboration. Seen Ekins and colleagues reviewing the recent Chart Marie Tooth research and priorities suggest that it is unlikely that we are going to see a dramatic change unless there is a wholesale shift in the process of drug discovery and development combined with increased collaboration between academics, industry, government labs, and research foundations in rare disease arena. How such a shift will concretely be orchestrated? What incentives could be created to instigate such change? One such incentive could collaborate to agree the thresholds for safe and clinically effective standards for diagnosis, care and treatment, and to collect international best practice. And third word might be smart innovation. As technologies are advancing, we are confident that we will, we will see routine in vivo gene editing in a medium time horizon. I added smart to innovation as again, the global community can and certainly will learn from rare diseases. We're faced with the option of editing uh, the human genome with ease and precision, precision. Notwithstanding the potential of these applications to be beneficial to any one individual, unforeseen risks such as epigenetic and intergenerational effects cannot be ruled out. Besides principled reasons, it is also because of these uncertainties that in, in interventions seeking to modify the human genome are banned in many countries. On the other hand, the question posed by US National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Medicine is no longer whether or not the human genome ought to be edited. Rather, the question is what should be the criteria for heritable germline editing and what principles should guide the governments of human genome editing. Such a shift in the approach for germline editing would probably have global consequences for individuals, societies, and mankind altogether. So on the way towards cure of some rare diseases, I humbly suggest to go this path with caution. Colleagues, I am sure that pooling, cooperation, and smart innovation will help to increase the attention to rare diseases globally. We're looking forward to being at your side. Thank you. With these inspiring words of Dr. Rudiger Precht, I would like to invite us all for a touching testimony. Maria was born in Wales, in Austria. When she was more than three years old, she was diagnosed with a rare disease. Well, number of operations, number of procedures did not refrain her from reaching her educational and professional goals. And she says that faith in God gave her strength to overcome all the difficulties. Please meet Maria Freyhofer.
Hello and welcome to my talk. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit of my life. First, I want to introduce myself. I'm Maria Brevova. I'm from Austria. I'm 24 years old and I have four healthy siblings. I have the diagnosis MPS4A, which is one of the mucopolysaccharidosis. I'm an office employee and I'm a Jesus lover. Uh, Jesus means the most for me in my life because he always gives me this strength I need and I always know there is someone who has a plan for my life even I, if I don't know how to go on. I also want to thank my family for always standing behind me and help me when I need it. They, uh, they are a great family. My diagnosis, mucopolysaccharidosis type 4A, morbus morcheo, I got when I was three and a half years old. The first thing my parents were told after my diagnosis were, was uh, she will lose her mind and die. As you see, nothing of both did happen. But there is no chance for healing. What does MPS4A bring? Uh, it's a progressing di disability. Uh, it's increasing disabilities with like short stature, hearing loss, coronal clouding, skeletal deformations, increased mucus production and weakness. <coughs> but as you see in this slide, MPS is not MPS. These patients are all uh, suffering from the same disease I do, but each of them is different, so you never can say what future is bringing. As there was no real chance for uh, therapy, we only had uh, the possibility to do uh, uh, things like surgeries in cervical spine, legs, and ears. And I'm also doing physiotherapy to keep me mobile because the better my condition is, the better I feel. I use medical aids like wheelchair, balance bike, e-bike, and hearing aids. As you see, I also do hiking with my balance bike with my family, which is great fun. But there always was the question, would I ever get the chance for um, enzyme replacement therapy? And yes, I did get the chance after 15 years of waiting. I started in the clinical trial in October 2011 in the Royal Fay Hospital, London. What did the clinical trial mean for me? Of course, there was the huge time investment uh, with the weekly flights from Austria to London and the long stay, which uh, were 10 to 12 days every three months. But on the other hand, it was a huge uh, improvement for me. I had regular examinations like six minutes walk test, uh, three minutes stair climb, bloods, lung function, and so on. And this, this showed that the improvement and I also uh, gained quality of life because I can cut my meal by myself now and handle my trousers alone on toilet. Uh, I have more energy and um, the mucus did uh, get away again. After 18 months, I had the chance to change the hospital to Villa Metabolica in Mainz. So it needed only one to do two days a week for me to get the infusion instead of three days going to London. And I also could start my job when I changed the hospital. In 2014, we were celebrating the approval of the drug which meant that I can get my infusion in Austria and 
don't need any flight uh, anymore to get there. But how could this work? It needed full commitment of all concerned, patient, family, hospital, and also pharmaceutical company. Was it worth doing this? Yes, definitely. Uh, I can say I am a super responder for this drug, but I didn't know this when I started the trial, but I knew it is necessary and important to do this because it, only if the drug is uh, approved, uh, many of the patients have the chance to get it. And I also were hoping for an improvement for myself. Research is essential for patients living with a rare disease because if there is no research, there wouldn't be a drug. But also without a study, there would be no approval and without patients, there's no study. Now I'm getting home treatment since October 2014. You can see now I can do nearly everything. During infusion, I can walk my dog. I can enjoy the garden. I also can stay in my own bed if I'm not in the mood to do anything else. And I also can go on holiday because my nurse is coming to the hotel. My mom always says, Getting home treatment is like heaven because we don't need to go anywhere. She only needs to open the door for the nurse. For the nurse. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Maria is the best example that human will and strength of mind is unlimited. After this nice and touching testimony, I would like to invite us all to watch the video message from Mrs. Daniela Boss, Director of Social Policy and Development Department of Economic and Social Affairs of United Nations. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I want to congratulate you on this important European conference on rare diseases and orphan products, the largest multi-stakeholder gathering in Europe for the rare disease community, covering research, development and uh, new treatments, health and social care, as well as public health policies. The United Nations and the Division for Social Policy and Development that I lead in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs has long taken the lead in promoting accessibility, equality, inclusion, and reduce the gap of inequalities with particular attention to groups of society that are more vulnerable. No one, no one has to be left behind. Our primary objective is to strengthen international cooperation and multi-stakeholder partnerships in the area of social development and promote greater social inclusion and well-being for all. We do this mainly through normative work, that is policy guidance, policy analysis and knowledge sharing, with some capacity building efforts in the areas of inclusive, evidence-based policy making and implementation. Where does health fit in the work of the United Nations and of the Division for Social Policy and Development? Well, I have an answer. You see, the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So with this in mind, it is easy to see how the work of the United Nations across all pillars contributes to ensuring access to good health of the world's citizens. 
From the perspective of our work in our division, there are three key areas in which the United Nations, as a space for political norm setting and collective commitment, can support the existing and still needed work on rare diseases. The first one, as I said, knowledge of sharing, that is identify and promoting appropriate public health policies, social protection initiatives and accessibility initiatives as well. The second one, effective international cooperation, encouraging and developing global partnerships in clinical and scientific research as well as in accessibility frameworks. And the third point, capacity building, working at regional, national and sub-national levels to help with the skills development and tool development for realizing commitments that we want to be made by governments. As well as rare diseases, we know that uh, rare diseases are not fatal, but they're often disabling. So. A major part of supporting the rare diseases community is accepting and addressing this interlinkage. So we believe that this allows us to go beyond the focus on medical care to promoting a social approach. I speak also out of personal experience. Since at the age of six, I had a very rare neuroblastoma pressing on the spine. I became paraplegic, I survived and decided that, that my personal mission is to empower those who are facing challenging health situations with hope, with my personal professional commitment to leave no one behind and prove that life is an amazing journey. It is the lack of attention to and inclusion of the needs of persons with rare diseases by society that makes their situation disabling. It is not the ability to see that excludes a visually impaired child from education. It is the lack of non-visual learning options that excludes them. This is just an example. So we are working to create a global culture of accessibility, where civil society from NGOs to the private sector and academia play a key role in supporting the endeavors of member states to make it happen. So I wish you a fruitful discussion with pragmatic solutions and the final outcome. Glad you are on board. Absolutely, and as, as we see uh, the three major trends, capacity building, absence of exclusion and pooling of knowledge are the key factors which are driving our future policies. With these words, I would like to invite Mrs. Lene Jensen. Lene Jensen is a CEO at Rare Diseases Denmark, the Danish National Alliance of 53 Rare Disease Patient Societies, an EURD network for ultra rare diseases. Lene Jensen is a former member of parliament of Danish parliament. Welcome, Lene. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, hello, everybody. I am going to give a rather uh, long presentation, and it would be nice if I had the daki daki dak to change the slides, which I don't. Did anyone see it? Because otherwise you're going to hear me talk for half an hour with no pictures on the screen. And oh, there it is. Thank you. Maria Thank you, Jan. Very nice, very nice. Um, as I said, I'm going to be talking for, for like half an hour, and that is pretty long. So before I start, I would like to see if you are all awake. Are you? Yes, you're all awake. Those of you who feel comfortable, would you please rise and do like that with your shoulders in order to... Come on, come on. Yes, looking good. Looking good. Oh, you're very good, sir. Very flexible. Thank you. So, you may sit. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to give a, uh, a presentation uh, on the uh, needs uh, and goals of rare disease uh, patients. And I'm going to do that because we are, in half an hour, going to discuss the priorities, which is most important of all the things that we really would like to, um, to do. 
And uh, with Eurotis at the table, uh, you can be sure that this has been discussed with a lot of patients before presenting this. Before I'm, I'm, I'm starting my presentation, I would like to show you this slide about where we are coming from progresses in the last 10 years. And to be honest, those of you who has been to conferences like this, you have seen slides like this before, right? Yes, you have. Those of you who have never attended before might think that this is a bit abstract, that it is not what you think about in your everyday real life, in your patient society, in your office, at the authorities, in your company, in your workplace, in school. This is not what you think about, right? Right, so many people nodding, that's right. But this is actually a picture of success and progress. It's a picture of the framework that we are working within and you probably know some of the documents from 2008, the uh, com uh, 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 communication from the European Commission, 2009, uh, the recommendation from the health uh, ministers, uh, 2011, finally, the cross-border healthcare directive, and we had expert groups, and we have a lot of papers, and in 2017, the European Reference Network made the final jump from a great idea into a difficult practice. That is a very important uh, jump. And all these activities, they constitute a framework for rare diseases on the national and on the European level that we as rare representatives have contributed to and should know how to operate. But where are we really at? Well, let me start with the good news, the green column, the happy face. We now have national plans or strategies in 24 countries. A decade ago, it was only four. We now have the ERNs, and thanks to them, the rare diseases are still at the forefront of health policy. And we also see a lot of new scientific developments, new therapies, and new diagnostic landscape that contributes to hope, as we just heard from, from Maria uh, a minute uh, ago. So that are the good things. But we also have another column, and it is less green. Some might even call it gray. And that is because when we see our successes, we must also say that the national plans and strategies, not all of them has made the jump from the bookshelf and out into reality in order to make life easier for rare disease patients. Not in many places there are a dedicated budget to help that jump, jump along and we do see an uneven implementation of the plans across the European Union and even within the single countries where the different policy areas are at very different stages. And all in all, I would like to say for myself that this is probably not satisfactory of what we wanted and want from the national plans. We also see that the ERNs, young as they are, have not yet fulfilled just a fraction of their potential. Uh, there's so much to do in order to uh, make the ERNs uh, connected to the national healthcare systems and to make them play the important role in healthcare pathways for all rare disease patients. And when we are excited about the new therapies and the new possibilities within uh, treatment, we also must face that we do have some challenges when it comes to pricing and access to therapies. The models that we know of uh, by now is not satisfactory and it's not doing what it's supposed to do uh, in order to create more and better treatment that actually reaches uh, the patients. So, what do we need to do? The answer is quite short, a lot. We need to do quite uh, a lot, and I think that the important fact is that no country can face the challenges of rare diseases alone. Uh, in order to have a, a new and even stronger and more comprehensive policy framework, we need 
to have clear priorities and clear goals in order to um, get, get on further. But how to approach this? What is the most important priorities that we have? Well, actually we've been working a bit on that. You all know the papers that Eurotis has published over the years, and if you don't, you should, because there are so many of them that is actually moving the borders for what we thought would be possible even a few years um, before. And also within the national alliances of Eurotis, we have discussed this uh, quite uh, a lot, and we have made a survey, and it's actually the results of this survey, survey I'm going to share with you today. And at the end of the presentation, we will all also ask you and hear about your opinions with the Slido thing. So if you didn't get it right uh, when Justina told you how to get on the Slido, you can do it now, provided that you can multitask, because I still want you to follow what is happening in my presentation. Um, so this was wrong. No, this is just, you know, I think it's a uh, little thing from the... Um, Nothing is really happening now. Yoo-hoo! Yes, here we are. So we made, we, made a, uh, we made a model in order to monitor uh, the future priorities for rare diseases. And this is, uh, maybe you think it's a complicated model, but actually it's not. So let me take you through it. So, in the middle you have the circle with four main areas that are absolutely vital to everybody living with a rare disease. And we have derived the four uh, main areas from all the work that has been done since 2008 with the communication and forward. And the fee three, four main areas are research, access to treatment, diagnosis and healthcare, and social care in the circle because they all depend on each other. The four main areas they have some building blocks. And the building blocks that you can see uh, is about, uh, at the bottom of the screen, is about codification, data sharing, collection of standards, interoperability, and IT tools. This is the building blocks we need in order to do something about the four main priorities. Also, we have a cross-cutting theme. I would like to call it the cross-cutting accelerators at the side of the screen, and that would be patient engagement and empowerment and education of all actors in the field. And then we must remember that when we discuss our priorities, it's a matter for Europe, but it's also a matter in the individual countries because a lot of the action that we need actually have to take place there. So this is the model for putting forward our priorities for the next decade. Does everybody understand this model? Yes, you do. No one is saying no, so I take it. It's yes. Thank you. That is, uh, that is very good. Uh, so let's go to the four main areas and see what the national alliances think about uh, the priorities. And now you have to imagine like 25 national alliances all over Europe, yes, there is more, but 25 participated actively uh, in the survey. They're sitting there, they are discussing, they are doing the survey all over Europe, and this is the results. And we will start with the green one, and that would be research. So, the national alliances, they have tried to prioritize uh, between the questions that you can see uh, on the screen, uh, and now I'm going to share with you the results. It looks like this. When you ask the national alliances what comes out on top as a top priority is systematic collection of findings from diagnostic and care. Surprised? Nah. You, you know, maybe you can even argue how can you prioritize between necessities because all this is quite important, and I would love to elaborate on that for the next couple of hours. But the truth is, I would probably not come up with a clever answer. And for the moment being, I ask you to, um, to accept the premises that we are going to do this kind of prioritization. Runners up in the research category, it sounds almost like the Eurovine Song Contest, but it's not, I assure you. But runners up are developing clinical research networks from URNs, 
horizon scanning and gap analysis of unmet needs and social research and research on quality of life. So that was the first of the four main areas, the priorities by the patients. The next one would be development and access to treatment for rare diseases. Um, these are the results. We have uh, two subjects coming out on top. The first one is patient reported outcomes and real world evidence as a part of developing uh, and treating rare diseases. And the second one is joint clinical reports for health technology assessments, also known as HTA. And as runners up, we have adaptive regulatory pathways and innovative clinical trial designs. I think this, these priorities, they actually feed right into the discussion about the need to do more across borders, but we will get back to that at a later time. So that was main area number two. Main area number three is about improving diagnosis and care for rare diseases. And we asked these questions, as you can see, and are you ready for the results? Yes, you are. Here they go. Again, we have two priorities coming out on top, and it is primary care referral to specialists for right diagnosis and or care. You might say referral to the right specialists for right diagnosis and care. And it's also deploying ERNs and anchoring international healthcare systems, that being for me a very, very important point. We have one runner up and that would be reinforcing collaboration uh, on undiagnosed uh, diseases, of course, also uh, very, uh, very important. That was three out of four. Number four, we have here social care for rare diseases, something that we are a bit less experienced with when it comes to European cooperation than the other areas that I have mentioned. And these are the uh, questions we ask the national alliances to prioritize out on top came mechanisms to support integrated care for rare diseases and uh, as runner up is integration of rare diseases into mainstream services and policies. Before I go on, I should tell you that this survey was um, uh, developed in a working group with uh, 10 members. I think that slide somehow got lost uh, in the confusion. Uh, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because 10 people has actually dedicated a lot of time to design this survey that we now have seen the results from. And I would like to mention that it is Alba from Spain, it is Claudio and Simona from Italy, it's Elena from Cyprus and another Elena from Greece, it's Geske from Germany, it's Ivana from Serbia, and it is our president of Red Diseases Denmark, Birte, and myself. And I do believe that they are all here. So please feel free to hunt them down or at least look them up uh, and ask them about their work and about their priorities. I think that would be interesting uh, to you. However, we're not quite done with the results because now we have seen the four main areas, uh, but we also have the building blocks. And we have always also asked questions about uh, the building blocks and how to, uh, to make our priorities. And here are the results. Out on top comes traceability of rare disease patient data across national healthcare systems and wider systematic use of offer codes, a very important point. We have two runners up, uh, which is systematic collection of uh, quality data at key settings and interoperability of registers databases. Whoa, a lot to do. And the last thing we have are the cross-cutting priorities where we also ask, so what is the most important features in order to accelerate what we are doing with the priorities that we have? And these are the results. Please note who came out on top. You did all of you who is uh, patient advocates because active engagement and active role of patient uh, advocates is seen to be the most important uh, thing to make our priorities uh, work. I mean, 
that is self-confidence, isn't it? When you ask the patient representatives what is most important, they say, we are. You know, I really like that. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a good thing that you're not, uh, that you're not shy uh, about that. Yes. So, we ask the national alliances and now we are actually going to ask you. Here you have the, uh, a slide uh, where we have listed the six priorities that came out on top in the four areas. You remember the model with the, uh, with the circle and stuff? So if we are very lucky and very good right now, you should have on your phones uh, Slido questions like this. It's gone, but it should be on your phone. Yes. And the good news is that you can choose two of those six coming out on top, and we have the first person voting. Number two. Number two, who wants to be third? Oh, eight now. You look so concentrated, that's good. 38. I'm not continuing until we reach at least 100. Okay, we'll make it 150, come on. <laughs> see, this is interesting, 150, thank you. I'm not closing it as long as I can see people looking down on their smartphone, taking that you're not SMSing with your husband or something. <laughs> I am, He's, it's his birthday today, so I have to. Okay, can we reach 200 and then I'll let you go. E yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think we can, uh, I think we can close uh, the vote. And we can, uh, we can also conclude that uh, patient reported outcome and uh, real world evidence actually comes out as a clear winner. And I think that's very interesting because that's something where you both have to develop a method, which is something we can do together. But it's also results that we have to collect that can be used on the national level as well as the European level. So I think it's very, uh, I think it's very interesting. Someone should take a picture of this so we can use it for the debate later, uh, if uh, if that would be uh, be possible. This was the results of the survey that we uh, did well, knowingly that it is not a perfect way to. Uh, ass assess uh, the priorities of the rare disease patient community, but nevertheless, we do now have uh, some kind of indication on what the way forward should be uh, for people living with uh, rare diseases when it comes to, uh, to this. First and foremost, we do need clear goals and priorities and those we are developing as we speak and as we are together for the next uh, few days. Uh, and we also need new or at least adapted instruments that provide for a comprehensive and consistent uh, policy framework that integrate all these components that we talk about that gives a new drive to the cooperation at the EU level and also that support the efforts in the member states because at the end of the day the member states are the level where things have to move concretely for the individual patient. So that is uh, very uh, important. We also still have the national plans and strategies and to be quite frank, I think with those we need a little less paper and a whole lot more of action. But someone has to initiate this, someone has to do it, someone has to advocate it. So the big question and the last one from me today is who is someone? No one? No one is someone? That's interesting. No, the point being, of course, that we are all someone. And I think that those of us who are in this room, we are absolutely someone and we can uh, do quite a lot to, uh, to make this uh, move. Uh, and I, now we saw on the slider that around 40% of people in the room are patient representatives. And 
I think that my final message should be that you should go home, not right now because you just arrived, but you should go home when the conference is over and you should take the priorities that we develop together with you and make them the origin of what you do with your advocacy. Uh, you should map the national decision makers and you should get to know them if you haven't done that already and they should get to know you because you are interesting people. So they should be glad that you are interested in letting them get to know you. And I also think that the point is that we, we have to do it together. No doctor, no nurse, no industry, no authority, no politician and certainly no patient advocate can move this area forward based on the priorities that we make. We can do that uh, and that is actually why we are here. Thank you very much for listening for so long. If there are any questions, we can have them in the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lene. It was really comprehensive, and now we understand what we're here for. What a message to take home. Uh, and now I would love to invite Mr. Jan Lacombe, who is a patient advocate who has dedicated more than 25 years of his professional and personal energy, efforts, and commitment to health, to health and medical research in non-governmental organizations in France, Europe, and United States in the fields of cancer, HIV, and rare diseases. More than 20 years ago, Mr. Jan Lacan was one of the founders of Eurardis, and since uh, 2001, he's the CEO of this organization. Well, I have read an interview with Jan Lacan where he was saying that we have to pool our expertise and our knowledge to um, grant an earlier access for patients for promising innovative drugs without compromising patient safety. And he's right. We have no compromises. We're not leaving anyone behind. So we're truly impatient to uh, hear the future trends, uh, policies and priorities of rare diseases, which will definitely contribute to tackle all the challenges which are arising in our way. So, Mr. Jan Lacombe and, and the plenary session, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Justina. So now I will call for uh, panelists to, to join. We'll have two of the speakers of this morning first. So I'm inviting Martin Seychell to join us um, and Lene Jensen. <clears throat> so if I may invite you, in fact, Second seat. Second, seat. Second seat. Thanks. And now I'm asking to three panelists to join us. Um, Dr. Christa Wirtemer Osch, who is the head of the Australian Austrian, sorry, Austrian Medicine and Medical okay. Devices. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to join in the next year in the middle, thank you. And Christa is also the chair of the management board of the European Medicine Agency. So somehow once every two months, she's my boss when I'm sitting on that management uh, committee. So I need to behave today. Um, Nathalie Moll, uh, I invite you to, to join. Nathalie, if you want to take the last seat in the, in the row. She's the Director General of FPR, the European Federation of uh, Industry uh, for Pharmaceuticals, but also biotech to some extent. And Natalie is also a leader on the, deep, on the policy on biotech uh, in Europe. And I invite uh, Holm Grasner uh, to join us uh, for the panel. Holm is the director of the Center for Rare Disease in Tübingen University in Germany. Uh, but at the European level, is the coordinator of the European Reference Network uh, RND, which is Rare Neurological Diseases, and is the leader of the major project Solvardi, which is about solving the unsolved in rare diseases 
and overall one of the major academic leaders in our field, I have to say, and privileged to work with. The way we will structure this panel, we have about an hour, so we'll finish at 12.40 uh, around. The, um, we'll have five minutes first with each of our uh, new panelists, and then we will take, uh, I will ask questions to uh, subgroups. What I will ask to each of you is to answer quickly, to try to have a lively discussions, because we'll have also to take questions from the audience and from the audience online. So we'll, we'll try to, to play that. It's gonna be challenging in one hour uh, with the agenda of setting uh, pr priorities. Remember that there is translation in French and in German if uh, you have not uh, uh, taken the devices yet, so you can still do it. So my question to starting with Holm and then to Natalie and Krista will be what should the priority or the priorities be in the next five, seven years for rare diseases? Thank you very much, Lan, Jan, and also many thanks uh, for the uh, invitation to be here in this panel. So uh, before I ask your question, I will give uh, some ideas on um, the role of the EMA. Uh, as you mentioned, I am the chair of the EMA Management Board. And the European Medicines Agency has a very important role in uh, coordinating the best available expertise in the European Union. And um, they are doing this work also via coordinating the work of committees and two specific committees are involved in the designation of orphan drugs and in the authorization of orphan drugs. This is the Committee for Orphan Medicinal Product and the Committee for Human Medicinal Products. I'm, a, I'm sure that you all know uh, what, is, uh, the, what are the requirements for an orphan uh, designation. As you said, we have to be brief in order to answer your questions. I only want to give you some numbers, uh, what has been the success of the recent years. This is that 66% of all the drugs who asked for a, applied for an orphan drug designation has received a positive opinion. That means in absolute numbers, these are 2,000 out of of 3,000 applications in the recent years, and about 8% of this received already a marketing authorization. These are around 150 medicinal products, um, and uh, a lot is ongoing. Uh, the question is, uh, so, so therefore, I would say that there was a success of the, uh, the, the regulation, the work done in the area of uh, orphan medicine a product, and, but we are aware a lot has to be done because there are a lot of still untreated patients. One point of the criticism, and I also want to mention that, are the increasing high prices for the orphan drugs. And um, the question is, when we are authorizing a medicinal product, does it really need, meet the patient? Does it really is available for the patient? patient? And you are asking me what are uh, the, the ideas and what are the most important things for the next coming years is that um, research and development uh, regulators, industry is working together in order to increase the number of orphan drugs and that there is also a cooperation with the payers. So um, early dialogue, early dialogue in the phase of development from the side of regulators we are offering to the developers in the form of scientific advice and also protocol assistance. And uh, I think we have to have a clear look then uh, at the incentives so that the incentives are used in the spirit of the regulation for orphan drugs, uh, but also take into consideration that there are responsibilities of the managers responsible for the healthcare systems. And therefore, we have to take also this possibility of joint scientific advice, the regulators together with the uh, health technology assessment and the payers, and to find a way forward that we are developing in the right direction, that products are available for those who need it to an affordable price. Thank you very much, Krista. Holm, would you like to t take on? 
Um, thank you, Jan, and thanks for the um, kind introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I would like to make three points. Um, so the first point is on the European reference networks. And I think it's already a vast achievement that the European reference networks exist. And I think a few years back, nobody had expected that um, 24 European reference networks with a lot of um, uh, healthcare providers um, would exist um, today. And it's, I think it's a kind of overachievement. And this um, large networks, which um, are larger than we um, expected uh, when we formed the networks, need time to become operational. So although it is already a kind of natural notion that the um, networks exist, they are not older than a year. So it is um, maybe a bit more than a year. The expectations towards the European network networks are enormous and rightly so. However, what I would like to request is a bit of patience, trust and level of funding that allows the networks to, de de to deliver on the different levels of, of activity. The, um, for the second point, I would like to reflect a bit on the other goal, um, on the other aim that by 2027, uh, all patients coming to medical attention with a suspected rare disease will be diagnosed within one year if the disorder is known in the medical literature. So normally, the uh, diagnostic care pathway starts with primary care physicians. They Unfortunately, normally don't have the time, resources or knowledge to do a diagnostic workup work even if they suspect a patient having a rare disease. So to avoid the start of the odyssey and actually to shortcut it, um, I would actually well, request to put the policy aim on the, uh, on the agenda to develop a robust primary, primary physician education and referral program in rare diseases, including e-health tools. And just um, commenting a bit um, on the second point um, further, given the growing complexity and also the great awareness of uh, providing a molecular diagnosis um, to a rare disease patients, I might think that we would like to think about um, having a um, European network infrastructure that is complementary um, to the European reference networks in which my colleague Olaf Ries called a European network for rare disease diagnostic centers. And the third point um, I would like to make is on the balance of um, um, innovation and de development of European rare disease um, research infrastructures and the users of these infrastructures. So we live in exciting times. That's um, completely obvious. Um, innovative European research infrastructures um, and services for rare disease data and, and, re and research are being developed. Um, they, they are great and they are absolutely needed, but we need to make sure that the local re rare disease researchers and clinicians know about them, can easily use them and benefit from them. Thank you, Holm. Natalie, would you like? Yeah, thank you so much, Jan. And, and first of all, thank you very much for including FPA this morning. Um, when people were speaking, I wasn't looking at my emails, I was tweeting or linking or sending the slides, all the slides of Maria's presentation to my colleagues in the office saying I wish they were here. Because to be honest, these are the kind of moments where people who are working in industry, and I know many of us are in the audience, um, realize and get motivated and moved and why we won't rest and why we work at what we do. So I just wanted to mention that because I think that your stories of courage and in involvement and dedication are incredibly inspiring and, and sometimes we feel like we do too little, in fact, from, from what we do every day. Um, I, I think we didn't mention this morning the, um, the European regulation on orphan drugs that was passed uh, quite a long time ago now that really is the fundament for all the incredible innovation that we have seen coming through the products that Krista was mentioning probably wouldn't be here if we didn't have that regulation. And it's an incredible example of when European added value really comes through, when Europe regulates to actually improve uh, an environment and incentivize such important and fundamental research. Um, as an industry, we can't say how much it's been important for us and how much we hope that we can uphold that regulation and, and, and make the most of it. Um, 
with over 7,000 products in development uh, today, we are really committed to continuing to work in this area. I often think of the rare disease area as a microcosm of uh, the medical area. It's really a, uh, an environment where everything is brought to the extreme. The illnesses are the extreme. They touch our children and they're chronic and seriously debilitating. The challenges are to the extreme. You were mentioning the pricing before, Krista, but the delivery, um, the diagnosis, everything is to the extreme of difficulty in a way. And, and for me, it's a great opportunity also as a scientist because if we find solutions in this area, they can be multiplied and used in so many other areas. So we all, I, I just wanna pass that message that as an industry, we are really committed in the long run to this area and exciting developments are happening. So gene therapy has stumbled and fallen many times since we started to be able to develop things and now finally products are coming through, advanced therapy products are coming through for this area and, and it's extremely exciting. Although as has been said many times this morning, there are other things that impede access, that uh, availability and, 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 and even just the idea that it takes years to be diagnosed and, and sometimes you're diagnosed and there's no therapy is, is unthinkable for a parent, for a patient, for a family or, or a friend. Um, so I think really we need to continue to build on the, on the successes that we have. The regulation and the incentives is a success, the, the ERNs and all the things that we heard about this morning. But we also need, and this is my, after one year in this position, we, we need to work more as a system because it's true that, that um, our medicines are of incredibly high value and the cost is borne at the beginning of, of, uh, of a patient's journey, but the value to the patient but also to the healthcare system is seen further on during the life. And so Maria was showing how during the clinical trials she was traveling to London and that's an incredible cost, personal but also economic, and then it was Germany, but then when the drug was approved, suddenly she's taking it at home in Austria, in Austria and then even out of the hospital and at home. So there's been an incredible evolution and, and if you think only of the price of the medicine, you also need to think about what the savings are when you actually have that medicine in the system. And I would really encourage us all to find that dialogue and to be honest in terms of, okay, this is, this is the healthcare system, this is the delivery of the product, where are the savings, where are the investments, and what is the best solution um, for each individual case. Thank you, thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you for these words of introduction from e each of you. I appreciate the fact that Krista, uh, looking at from the European regulatory system, is immediately mentioning the collaboration with HTA and with the payers to, in order to address some of the challenges of the development and of the sustainability, so we come back to that. And also the call for uh, a dialogue and partnership in a system approach that Natalie is mentioning in this uh, area, and I will come back to some of the remarks from, from home. Before moving into these specific questions of uh, priorities, I propose to go back first to Martin Seychelles on the more political part, just to get rid of that part, uh, of the uh, multiple financial framework of EU that you mentioned this morning. <clears throat> so I'd like to check with you we are clear about the risk and opportunities, but also to hear your advice on how to position where this is in this new environment. What we understand is that by moving with what comes out from these proposals for the moment of budget, it's very good news on the research health front, increase of budget, and health is a priority, and then there is an increase of budget, so that's good news. Good news also is the digital agenda which is growing with more resources and higher priorities. And a lot of what we've heard this morning, including from the survey from National Alliances, it's all about being real and about data. It's all about collecting the findings from diagnostic and care. It's all about real world evidence and, ev and continued uh, evidence generation and et cetera. So digital is gonna be important. Now about the health. The fact that health will be into the social fund, so that includes the structural funds, right? Does that mean that there is an opportunity for us to bring more together health and social? Does that bring that there is more opportunities to access uh, or to promote funding at national level 
for the healthcare providers of the European Funds Networks, but also to create uh, social services like the respite centers or the resource centers for rare diseases. And on the risk, is there a growing risk that the member states are going to dominate any beginning of discussion at the Commission in Health? Because what we have observed over the years is progressively a higher difficulty for Commission to initiate, to take leads and, and to uh, bring a vision and more in the hands of the member states. So we immediately feel, oh, okay, it's going to be an even growing difficulty. So what's going to be your perspective on that? Okay, thank you. So, so you, you, you put your finger there on some interesting issues. First of all, uh, as regards the opportunity side, I think they are very clear. Uh, despite the very challenging financial fiscal environment, the Commission has taken a very clear decision to support research, to support the digitalization of sectors that can benefit from that, and health is certainly one of the main ones. Um, the health program, it's an interesting question. First of all, its move under the social fund serves, first of all, a, send a very clear political message that the Commission sees health as a fundamental cornerstone of the European social model. So in a way, um, uh, it's, it's kind of in its rightful place there. What does this mean in practice? You may have noticed, even under the current health program, we are placing a greater and greater emphasis year after year on implementation. What matters is not so much that we continue to generate, you know, good practices, ideas, those are important and those are still coming through. But what is even more important is that the best practices are actually implemented. And we have set up structures to actually identify with the help with the member states, ask the member states to help us identify the areas where they need support for implementation. And this is the answer to your second question. If you were to depict it like you just pointed out that, you know, is the commission in, in control or are the member states, that would would have me very worried because it means that we are maybe having different sets of priorities. That would be a major problem if that were the case. Fortunately, that isn't the case because when we enter into a dialogue with the member states, as we do on a daily basis, as you'd expect, you begin to understand exactly what the EU structures should support. Um, what was missing until now in the European system was the clear, a clear mechanism for member states to clearly specify the areas where they are in need of support the most. So we, did, we had joint actions, but the joint actions were more about generating kind of guidelines, manuals, etc. There was very little implementation going on. And if I were to ask a very honest question, how many of those joint action results are actually now mainstreamed in the national health systems, I would honestly say maybe not so many. There are some examples, some exceptions here or there. So one of the reasons why we stopped the steering committee on prevention and promotion was actually, in fact, to enter into a dialogue with high-level representatives of the member states who would tell us very clearly which of the best practices they were in need of the most. And then we would do our job, which is to find the right instruments, whether it's the health program, the research program, the, the, the structural reform support service, because that's what we're really good at. What the Commission is good at is not telling member states how to run their business. I mean, the Commission has a lot of skills, but one skill we do not have is the experience of running a country. So we leave that to the member states. What we are good at is, is the knowledge of the instruments, because we designed them. We know what those instruments can do. So if you come to us with a challenge, we might say, the right tool is the Structural Reform Support Service, or it's the FC, or it's the health program, or a combination. And that's what we're doing at the moment. So the answer to your question is, we should be in collaboration, not in competition. And, and what you will see also in the next MFF is a much more strong emphasis on using different programs to address the same issue. Um, a, a complex issue such as rare diseases cannot be solved just through the health program or just through the research program. It needs all the programs that are relevant, and believe me, a lot of them are or should be relevant. And, and then you use, you, com you, you devise the ideal combination of programs, each using the intrinsic strengths of each program 
to tackle this issue over time. That is the challenge. So you will see much more of that than in the past. Of course, it means the Commission has to work more across silos, and so do the members. <coughs> and just to follow up, and I stop here, does it mean that the questions of drug development, regulatory affairs, and access to medicines is going to be also in the social fund, or is going to be into a more European single market ambition? Th this is such a, a, a major issue. It has to be dealt with across the board. It has to be dealt with across the board. So there are um, certainly internal market issues, because we have to keep in mind that you know, technologies are placed in an internal market, so there are rules and there are structures. But there is an important and growing social dimension to it. I mean, the issue of access and affordability is something we have to tackle together. This is not something, as I said before, where we should be just presenting the opposing points of view. Uh, of course, those have to be said, but we have to find a way, and, and one of the ways to do that is to see how can we put in place structures which are geared towards collaboration. This is why, for example, the issue of, of data you know, and research. When I uh, still read about the long times for diagnosis, the very small percentage of rare diseases and indeed other conditions as well where there is treatment available, although we have made significant progress, but we're still a, f a long way ahead, it means there is a need for more collaboration. We need to share more data. We need to make sure that we can do that. And that is what this debate on the incentives should ultimately lead to. Mm -hmm. Of course, preserving what needs to be preserved and strengthening what needs to be strengthened. Thank you. So I guess one of the, not surprisingly, but one of the take home message already in terms of priority is to make sure that we all in this room work at the national level, closely in conjunction with the European level, if we want to make things move. And particularly, I will turn with the a question to Hon on the European French network, is that listening to what Martin just said, but also looking back at the survey that Lene presented, the, the disconnect between the European French network and uh, the healthcare system, and how we move toward healthcare pathways. So to make my question a bit longer, our ambition is obviously that we want, don't want just to improve the health status of the 100 patients into the IT clinical virtual system, but we want to improve the health status of 30 million people. So how do we go in the direction of this clinical excellence and improve patient outcomes? So what will be on your perspective to make DRNs operational and to deliver on clinical excellence? What, what do we need, what is needed in the, in the coming years for that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess you were you, um, referring to my, my youth and health network um, hat. So I see actually um, three, po three, three main points. And, um, Can you speak closer? Sorry, try to. Closer. Yeah. Closer? Okay. Um, I see three, three main points. Um, so the one point you already mentioned, and that's the um, interconnection, uh, the anchoring of the European Netflix networks um, to the existing national healthcare systems. But that's one main point, and I think this um, interconnections and the, the interface is um, um, not very clearly de developed yet, and that's a major effort um, we need to do. Um, the second point um, I see is actually um, the um, compatibility of the uh, national accreditation systems being used for rare disease centers and the European accreditation system used for the European Nephilim networks. Because in, in some countries, they are just, just not um, according. So um, you could qualify for a rare disease center um, nationally, but not be able to qualify for, um, at least fulfill a condition to qualify for a European Nephilim network. So compatibility of those processes, I think, are very important. And the third issue um, I, I might touch on, and that's um, maybe visionary, but um, we, we need to see, is the use of the clinical pa patient management system, the CPMS, not only in the EN context, but also in the national context. So from, from our perspective, it would be great that the same system for e-health, for e-health in um, rare diseases, could be used also for national rare disease networks. Lenny, would you like to follow on that? On the well, if you would allow me uh, just a short <coughs> comment on the discussion that the two of you had. I, I, you know, on one hand, I think it is, it is absolutely great that when you say, sir, that a lot of different areas has to contribute to the area of rare diseases. On the other hand, I always get a bit nervous when a lot of people share responsibility. 
because sometimes it's like when you have a lot of people responsible for something, actually no one is really responsible. And that is a bit of a problem. And then we're back to who is someone has to do something. So it's just a, 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 a nosy comment uh, on that. <laughs> we don't really have to applaud that. It's a sad truth. When it comes to the ERNs, I think that, that uh, a lot of us is a bit puzzled when it comes to patient involvement. I know Eurotis is doing a lot with the EPACs and so forth, and, and, and thank you for that. But it is very challenging for the patient representatives on the national level to actually contribute to this. And I think that if we are to link together the great ERN thoughts with the national praxis, the patient representatives can have a key role, but it takes something. It needs a setup that is a bit stronger, I think, than, uh, than today, and I also hear you sir, uh, acknowledge that. Uh, so I think if we can make that a priority to make the patient representatives a key to the link on the national level, then we would, uh, we would get a step, uh, a step further. Thank you. Let's turn to audience. Do we have first questions on these two first parts of discussions or not yet? Yes, we have a first question here. So we have four colleagues normally around the room who are with microphone to help you. Yeah. So please introduce yourself first and a brief question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lorna Kieran. I'm here representing 22Q11 Ireland, which um, is the most common rare disease chromosomal disorder. And my background is as a researcher. Sorry, could you, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yep. If you can speak closer because we don't hear you from here. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. so my name is Lorna and um, I've been supporting 22Q Ireland, which is a patient advocacy organization for the most common rare chromosomal disorder, 22Q11, Point two deletion syndrome. We've spent three years collaborating with clinicians, researchers, academics, patients, young people, children, and to our great disappointment, we still haven't secured funding for an integrated care clinic in Ireland, despite the great need. We know that we only can identify 10% of patients in Ireland, so we should have about two and a half thousand patients, but we only have 250 on, on the patient database. So my question is, could the European Commission please consider designing and building in support for patient organizations to employ researchers and project coordinators? Because the amount of time and energy and money that is required to coordinate very complex interagency and interdisciplinary applications, it's not realistic for busy hospital consultants or for busy academics or for parents of very sick children to invest their, their time and energy in these European applications. Thank you. Okay, so questions online. Uh, thank you. I'm taking a few questions before we answer. Justina. Yes, we have, uh, we have a few questions online as well. Um, and so how could European Commission could help and contribute to put more pressure on national governments to facilitate national plans for rare diseases? Okay, so it's two questions back to you, Martin, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're regretting to come to Vienna now. <laughs> thank you, you're brave, you're the brave one, so thank you for being Not at all, that's one of the reasons why I came, was to hear what, what uh, everyone has to say. Um, first of all, the, the, uh, the funding, direct funding to support uh, various uh, you know, NGOs, stakeholders, organizations. This, of course, is already envisaged uh, to a certain extent, for example, in the current health program. But we have to be very honest, it is a very competitive environment. There are simply too many good causes to be supported. Um, you know, and whereas, of course, we should continue to do that, and we, we will uh, you know, consider how the best way to do that, I think there's also the other dimension to this, because uh, first of all, there's the issue of, of, of the, the role that these organizations play in supporting national policy. You know, we cannot compensate or substitute if these organizations are not adequately involved at national level. I'm sorry to say that, but we cannot uh, do that. I mean, the, 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 the European budget, as, as big as it is, is just 1% of the total um, you know, budgets of the EU altogether so this is this is what it is so 
Um, we have to, uh, I think, also uh, encourage our member states to make better use of the expertise that is in these organizations. And sometimes member states can get much better. Uh, um, yes, yeah? but, but if I may, Martin, yeah. I think that goes back to, uh, and I think we could go around this room and we will hear a lot of the same issue that how to maintain the momentum at the member states level. Yes. Because we are 10 years after the Commission communication on rare disease and cancer mm. recommendations. The second question. As Lenier, Lenier just showed, member states have developed national plans, but they are not always so useful. And in the meantime, we have progressed. There is clarity yes. on what yes. some priorities should yes. be, and we have the errands for that. Yes. So my question is, we understand that there is many priorities and other good causes. Now, there is not so many good causes with high European added value, and we've seen the benefit of soft laws, like recommendations to engage the member states to do more. So one of the questions that we have is, is the Commission ready to a new next step 10 years later with a new soft law, like a recommendation on rare diseases, not to compress the question of rare disease only on orphan drugs and ERNs, but in a more broader perspective as it was just demonstrated this morning? That's always an option, and certainly we may come to that at some point. But I think the step we are in now is to really, first of all, put the existing infrastructure on a sound and permanent footing, as I said before. That's the first priority, because what we've done so far is we've opened doors. You know, the ERNs, I see them as, and, and all the mechanisms under the cross-border directive, which is where all this came from, they clarify at least the mechanism mm. through which patients can be referred from across different health systems. But this is, a, this is just the very beginning. I mean, what, what needs to be now addressed is what will happen once those doors are fully open. First of all, is to make sure that as much as possible, it's the data, as the, the knowledge that flows, and not necessarily the patients. We've seen the terrible you know, human cost of having to travel, um, sometimes you know, very young patients, etc. This is, this is something which we want to minimize, not maximize. No? So our, our motto has always been to bring the knowledge to the patient through those doors. Secondly, the data needs to start flowing through those doors. As I said before, it would be a mistake if the member states see the ERNs as simply a tool of last resort where they simply refer the handful of patients who are really the most difficult cases. Those cases, as important as they are, I would be very happy to just help one patient. But that is not going to maximize the added value. What will maximize the value is if through those ERNs, we can pool all the data from all rare disease patients in Europe. Which means which means, patient, the link with which the means patient pathways. Patient pathways which for means all patients. Which means thinking system of healthcare where we collect data about all rare disease patients, yes. not only the one using the ERN service. Those will be a right? small fraction maybe. Right. And maybe they will not be the most typical patients because typically, Patients that will be referred will be the difficult cases, and difficult cases may be the atypical cases, the ones can, that are not. Can we follow up on that with Natalie and, and, and uh, Harman and Krista, in fact? Because is one of the key elements for the future of ERNs, from what we heard, but also again, if I go back to the survey of this morning, is hope to bring together more closely European French networks as the healthcare, together with the research. And in the middle, it's all about the data, collecting the findings from, again, diagnostic and treatment, but also this is where can be generated the new knowledge uh, with the real world evidence and et cetera, right? So, th which then has an impact also on the treatment, not only on the, on the guidelines of care. So, wh what's your perspective? Because we need to bring healthcare research together, but also the public-private partnership is, has a key role to play when it comes to all this data. Natalie. Thank you so much, Jen. Yes, I think, um Certainly, there are incredible examples under the public-private partnerships like IMI, where we're really trying to progress um, all areas linked to digitization and the use of, of data and, the, and more than the use, the connectivity, because the real problem is that many countries or many centers are producing data, but they're difficult to use or they're not you know, you, you can't pass them anyway. So certainly as FPO, we've um, also funding a, a European Health Data Networks initiative where we're trying to not pool the data, but actually make sure that data has, is collected and, and, and stored in similar ways so that then they are, these, way, these are able to be communicated back and in no other area, again, probably because of 
rare diseases, in no other area is it more necessary because diagnosis really depends on the data, the treatment, uh, the, the, the direction that you send the patient in. And so I, I think you'll find that, um, as you said, you, the, the European added value in this area in particular is fundamental because countries can do a lot on their own, but in fact, because of the number, rare number of patients and the incredibly complex uh, illnesses, there is a, an incredible need for interconnectivity. And I was speaking to somebody before who, who was talking about the 70s and, and you know, the, no internet in the 70s and how patient communities were isolated, countries were isolated. And now we have these incredible tools and we really need to make sure that we have the standards in place everywhere in order to make most use of them because otherwise we're just wasting a lot of time and money uh, and most importantly time for, for patients. Yeah, perhaps also to add, um, it's a global issue. Yeah? On one hand, you said we have to break it down at national level. It's a national implementation plan. On the other hand, when we're talking about uh, the data available, big data, we, we look uh, more or less very global. And perhaps also to add um, to the question of early dialogue, uh, it's not only in Europe. It is also that there is the possibility and we offer scientific advice also together with the FDA because it's a global issue. And um, yes, big data, they are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And also we from the regulatory authority have to learn how to handle that, which tool can be used in order to best evaluate it and uh, bring it forward in the assessment process. Please, Jan, allow me another sentence uh, or an answer in uh, relation to the engagement of patients. Because I think this is, this is very, very important. And then you said, yes, it's the patient who is investing a lot of time and effort. Uh, yes, and uh, it's also that patients are nowadays involved also and raise their voice in an authorization process. And Jan, you your own have been one of the vice chair of the Committee of Offer Medicinal Products and you have a long experience in acting, very active in these uh, committees. And at the national level, I have to say that we from the side of an authority, we want to get in contact with the patients, to have an open dialogue. And yes, Compliment to all the rare disease to Porer, but the only one who we really had contact. So I know that you are really very, very actively engaged, and this is of very, very valuable importance. Thank you. Um, so, so first on the um, um, involvement of patients um, and patient representatives in the European Health Network. I think um, we are completely on, on the same page as um, regards um, to involvement of patient representatives on, on all levels. So that's absolutely needed. So um, we need them involved in, in each working group and on the governance um, level as well. And um, it's, it's a bit of, of circle. So the better you get and the, the more substantial the, the input of the patient representatives is, the, the higher the expectations are. So I, I do think that um, funding and um, also um, um, support of uh, patient representatives for the European Nephros Networks is absolutely in need. Um, the, the second comment I would like to do is on the data um, front, um, which um, we started to discuss. And that I would like to do from the diagnostic point of view. And um, as, as you heard from the introduction, I'm also the coordinator of a, a rather huge um, diagnostic research project. And I think to actually transfer what um, is being done um, in the diagnostic realm to, to um, delivery in the diagnostic field, uh, a couple of things. And data collection, systematic data, data collection and sharing was a point Lena made already. I think that was place one actually in, in the survey uh, being done. So that's very important, but also to have the techniques and the infrastructure to do so. And it's, it's in place now and regaining momentum to do uh, data sharing for uh, phenotypic data and also for genotypic data. That's all good and it's, it's very good and it's cool. Uh, but for the multi-omics data we are just now doing in for, for diagnostic research, we haven't got those depositories in place yet. So we need investment and we need um, to have um, um, those um, infrastructures for, for sharing these data as well. 
Second, I mean, data, data sharing and data collection is one thing, but interpreting, uh, interpreting data and understanding data is um, another thing. And we need, I, I do believe, um, interdisciplinary expert groups which are able to deal with um, those data. And I think SolfRD, the, the uh, hopefully coming AGP, but also uh, professional organizations like the um, European Society for Human Genetics or the European Health Networks should play a role in that. And the third point, and that's a point um, you just made, um, is I think when, when um, actually transferring um, uh, insight from diagnostic research to um, uh, diagnostic um, care, um, standardization and quality should be in the mind frame from the very beginning. And, and that's very, very important. So um, otherwise, we won't be able to transfer and transfer very easily and, and directly. So quality and standardizations are really key issues. Absolutely, absolutely. We could, on this second, uh, give the floor to, to Lene while you're thinking about your questions coming to you. Yeah, it's just two small comments I was thinking about whether I, I perfectly understand the point of view that we should get the structures that we have already designed to work. Um, and it is very important that they do. Uh, but also when we talk about the instruments and the flow of data and the IT systems and so forth, there's one instrument we must not forget, and that is the instrument called networks, networks between patients and networks uh, with between patients and professionals. And that is why I think that it should not be, it's important also to make priorities that make these networks actually work. That was one thing. And the other small comment would be on the perspective, whether as to put forward the broader perspective of rare diseases. Let me tell you a story, so just a small one. And that is that with the paper in hand that was made in 2009 from the health ministers about national plans. We convinced in our country, our health minister to do a national plan and we had had no chance if we did not stand with that piece of EU paper in our hands. And in order to promote the benefits of working together on rare diseases at the national levels, there's no bigger help than the help we can get from the European expressing that. It makes it so much easier for us to explain on the national level, and that is why we strive also for the broader perspectives. And yes, that's it. Of course, I mean, I fully agree with you that we should have a complementary approach. I mean, the EU level is not separate or distinct from the national level, we should be working together. However, of course, uh, I think what has changed in the past few years has been that member states look to the EU more now for a more practical approach. I think that the days when we could change things just by issuing a piece of paper in Brussels, and I'm being very honest and frank, politically have changed. What will make a difference? And I'm really, I think, optimistic for this reason, because if we see, despite the very challenging political environment, which we are all aware of, if you see the past five years in particular, what has happened in the area of health, you mentioned networks. We have networks of member states and other stakeholders cooperating in practically every major area of health, whether it's the ERNs, HTA, HSPA, digital health, joint procurement, vaccination, everything I can mention. All of this did not exist five years ago. What has changed is that the Commission has made a very determined and visible effort to be more effective in supporting implementation. This is, this is what we need to do and what we will continue to do. And therefore, if we are to issue documents, and certainly there may be a need and we are still issuing documents on various issues. I mean, I mentioned the digital health communication, which is very relevant to rare diseases. It has to be the, the, really a document oriented towards saying what we can, can do about the problem. What are the instruments we can bring to bear? Uh, so just for example, uh, and, and I, can, I can already say this, we are very open and, and if necessary at the next meeting of the steering committee to, to start a discussion among member states about whether they would be willing to, um, out to start a process of sharing data um, on rare diseases through the ERNs um, or through any other mechanism they may decide. 
let's work together to uh, specify the conditions uh, under which this can be done. Um, and we have to start a discussion, and we're ready to place it on the agenda of the next meeting. So uh, if there is interest from member states, uh, we are willing to play our part. Thank you. So, oh, questions from the audience? Yes, here. So, please introduce yourself and ask your questions. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm Lisa Murphy, and I'm a very proud EPAC, the patient representative of an ERN. And I would request from the European Commission help with the sustainability of the ERNs. And we do need that from you instrumentally. Otherwise, they are going to be treated like a project. So I am requesting this from you, and this is my question. How can you support us? And we are very, very happy as patient representatives, many, many colleagues around here in this room to help with the national implication and making national healthcare work with the ERNs. We do need support from the EU. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I would like to collect a few questions before asking the panel to answer. Yes. Thank you. Bruta Tomiena, Board of Member Representative from Lithuania. Uh, we have here, here very nice uh, questions raised about national plans uh, and uh, uh, sustainability and also EAN integration into national systems from Eurordis. Uh, however, I would like to raise uh, the, an issue of uh, working uh, together with other stakeholders because very the same questions were recently in several recent uh, weeks uh, very much extensively surveyed and uh, uh, also uh, discussed in board of member states and also ADI action and also uh, EAN uh, coordinator groups. Sometimes it seems that we work in parallel but not together. So I just would like to call for working together for to share our uh, results and I, I guess it, 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 it would be a more uh, effective way. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm Marlene Cady, uh, founder and president of PSC Patients Europe, and my sidekick is ERN Rare Liver. Uh, further to my uh, to the comments from both my Irish um, colleague and uh, Lisa, uh, I want to share some thoughts with you because I trust that in this audience I don't have to. Uh, explain to you that uh, if you have a rare disease you need to operate on an international level because you want to create mass therefore you have to operate on an international level but uh, for many of our patients organizations there's no um, financial uh, model at the same time the ERN patient advocates uh, we have reached out to our Minister of Health to uh, try to facilitate us and they are saying they are not facilitating because the other member states are also not facilitating the ERN patient advocate. So we're going round in circles. Uh, sir, you asked for a... a Please a, come to your question. Uh, you asked for a practical approach. Facilitating is not only uh, um, money. If you can have um, the social uh, benefits allowing us to do volunteer work and to uh, do uh, work on your education, I think that will help a lot of uh, ERN patient advocates. Thank you. Thank you. Just for people in the room to understand the difficulty we have here, we have a challenge, is that we have a very bad echo. So the longer you make your question, the more difficult it gets for us. So that's, I'm sorry to say that, but that's technical reality. We have a question online, Justina. Yeah, yeah definitely. We do have a lot of relevant questions online, and, and, and some of them were already answered by the panelists. We will address few questions to other specific theme, theme sessions. 
But there is a question from France, from a father of babies suffering a rare disease, and it, it concerns, uh, do you have a prescription for facilitating cross-border care, especially in these cases when doctors are reluctant to send a patient abroad to seek for a better treatment? Yeah, very good question. Okay, excellent. So w maybe we start with this one. Lene, you want to answer? <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but I don't have any prescription for that. It is a, is, is a problem that we face um, also in, in, in my country, and it's one of the examples that we really need something to stand on when we make our advocacy. Uh, uh, the uh, directive about cross-border healthcare is excellent. The way it's implemented in the countries are questionable, at least in, in, in some countries, and I think it's a very good example that we do need a strong opinion from the European Union to be able to do something about it. And uh, I think our, the person asking is touching upon something that we have to take very seriously. No, to, um, the, the last question on um, sending a, a patient abroad to, to an expert if the um, uh, treating uh, physician um, doesn't want to. Um, so I think that's a question on access to, to care. Um, and it's um, from the European Reference Network perspective, it's um, um, a question on, on how to um, shape the respective uh, care pathways. Um, and that, that's, um, um, I think, a very tricky one and also a heterogeneous one because the um, healthcare systems in different European countries are also so different. Um, so I, I might answer that uh, with, the, with the experience we have um, um, in Tübingen and actually we, we, we try to, and that might be not a, a very satis satisfactory answer um, for, for a patient, we tried actually to um, get um, the treating physician and the patient on the same page and then that's the access condition to the center. Um, that might be not as said, satisfactory, but that's how we do it at the moment to have um, sufficient information. And if that can, can be done, we might have um, the information which is needed actually to um, um, have um, access to, to further um, healthcare structures. Yes, um, first of all, um, we have to make sure that every patient in Europe has access to a pathway. Oh. Um, this is, of course, member states need to define this. They need to update their national plans to take account of the fact that now you have the ERNs, you have the mechanism. Member states, of course, all have different means. Some of them will have the possibility to treat in the country, others don't. But the principle has to be that no patient should be left in a dead end, with a one-way street with no exit. Uh, and, and therefore, the, the immediate task that I see is that these pathways have to be defined and then, of course, brought to the attention of all physicians at all levels so that they know exactly. A lot of the delays in diagnosis happen because the pathway is not very clear and it takes a lot of toing and froing until you finally hit the right combination. This we know. On the issue of sustainability, this is, of course, the next big challenge. Uh, let me be very clear. We are prepared to continue to support the ERNs through the health program for as long as it takes until we, we have liftoff, uh, until we get... So that is not... Uh, an issue. However, of course, it does raise an issue that we will, would like to expand our area of activity. We'd like to bring in uh, more areas of activity. Uh, and therefore, if we do not find also other uh, funding mechanisms, we will reach kind of a limit of what we can do to increase the scope to benefit more patients. So we have also to, I think, to work together to identify other sources of funding that are sustainable. We are looking into a number of options. So for example, uh, what could be the role of the research program? The role of PPPs could be very interesting. Uh, the Commission is also actively reflecting in the ne for the next MFF on public-private partnerships, but it could also be public-public, and there are various permutations of that. Um, basically, um, the Commission is thinking for the next MFF about how to also widen the definition of public-private partnerships or indeed other types of partnerships. So to bring in more actors. For example, the, 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 uh, the very successful experience of the IMI was mentioned. We need to build on that. We need to see what we can do to have an even better um, you know, successor to that. 
Um, and there are many areas I could mention, the FC, the Fund for Strategic Investments, which will now be the new EU Invest EU program. There is a lot of potential there that can be explored. Um, and I think the answer lies in exploring those routes. But to be very clear, until those routes are open and clarified, we will continue to support using the health program. So that is... Thank you, Martin. And really two important points, obviously, uh, for everyone. Patient pathways at the core of the work in the coming years between member states, board member states, ERNs, commission, patients, and also this funding scheme that you just mentioned was one of the questions you had, we had for you. Thank you. I'd like to move, and we'll have limited time, but to my last topic, which is sustainability of access to new treatments. It was clearly identified also in the presentation this morning, and we all know that's a major issue. We don't want to preempt too much most of the conference about that topic. There is other places where we discuss that. But I want to take the opportunity of having you here in the panel to ask you the following question. Is that we've published last year a position paper which is breaking the deadlock of access to rare disease therapies. So our feeling, right or wrong, is that now we don't need to contemplate the problems anymore. There is plenty of solutions on the table. Some of them are already on their way of implementation, like early dialogue, like prime, some adaptive pathways, uh, adaptive design, etc. But some others, or HTA, uh, maybe uh, assessment at European level, but some others are not. And this is the question we have to you today, is can we count on you, industry, commission, and regulators to take, to commit to take action to address the issue. We really think it's not gonna work like that. It's not gonna work with some of these drugs high priced. We, it's not gonna work that we're, gonna, we're not gonna benefit all the medicines that Krista just mentioned. We will not have access to them after that. That's just not, it's inequality, it's non-ethical, it drives us crazy. So we need to find a better way to work so my question to Martin will be, if some member states are coming to you, 10 of them, saying we are ready to collaborate and to bargain, to negotiate with industry with a quick pathway to patients, are you ready to support them or will say, mm -mm, I have to discuss with the others? Natalie, if we come to you and say, are you ready to discuss seriously predictability of your economy and also evidence generation rather than price. Are you ready to do that? And are you ready to take the leaders of your community to do that? And Krista, are you ready to involve the payers in your early dialogue and design? Because that's the problem. Drugs are coming to market with, lim with too high uncertainties. We need to find a pathway together to generate evidence after and, and adapt the price according to that. So, who, get, who goes first? Very simple answer is yes. I mean, the Commission has always been very clear. We will play our part uh, in any way to support the member states to address this issue together with industry. What we want to avoid is useless rhetoric. Um, and we're already doing that. I mean, this is the spirit of the HTA proposal. It, but it's also, uh, we, we note that also very interesting ideas from these regional groupings where member states are coming together, the Beneluxa group, the Nordic group, uh, the Valletta group, uh, the Visegrad group have all you know, these mechanisms. We have said many times, we are fully prepared to mobilize and support. You know, it's member states just need to tell us what, they, what support they need and we will, we will provide it, no, no worries about that. Um, and of course, the ongoing debate about the incentives offers a great opportunity. If we avoid, you know, again, a, a useless head-on clash and work in a collaborative spirit, I think it's a golden opportunity to design uh, a future which benefits everybody. And this has to be the, the aim, uh, a win-win situation for everybody. Go ahead, Krista, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, my answer, my clear answer also is yes. We have to cooperate. And um, it is not enough that the regulators are providing their best expertise, but uh, assessing the dossier, giving a positive opinion, and the Commission then is granting the, the, the marketing authorization and don't care about pricing and how a patient really can access the drug. So we have to be together at an early stage during the development. So we, we have to, to discuss it together. And uh, I have to say that it is also very important and interesting for us to hear from the other group which question they are asking. 
and that these questions are also taken into consideration during the assessment. So clear answer, yes, we have to cooperate, so only so we can guarantee that the patient at the end will get the product. So I'm, I'm going to continue on the wave of yeses, yeah, unsurprisingly. I mean, for me, there's no question that we need to optimize the whole system in order to make sure that we have as equitable access as possible. We have shorter pathways in R&D and access. The early dialogue between HTA and regulators in order to make sure that we as an industry, we know what we're expected to produce and we can just eliminate wasteful research and just get everything done as quickly as possible. Um, the HTA proposal from the Commission, it's no secret that FPA is extremely uh, supportive of this. We really believe that these are areas where if we collaborate, we can be more effective and optimize timing as well and, 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 and get faster access for patients. Um, Martin talked about preserving and, and strengthening what works and what needs to be strengthened and that is, I think, uh, it goes through the, in the whole system, that the, the, the opportunities that we have um, to really look at the system as it is today and make the connections and the collaborations that will optimize um, delivery. And I just wanted also to take the opportunity because the patient engagement, we've talked about it many times, it's extremely important also in this area. Um, there is a new um, project under IMI, under this public-private partnership called Paradigm, and it's, I really encourage all the patient organizations here today to look into that. It's, it's a new project that is aimed at uh, providing a structured framework for patient engagement in a, in a sustainable and ethical way and in a meaningful way throughout the whole medicine's life cycle, so also including uh, in, in HTA and all different levels. And I think if we also optimize that, we'll be much more um, clear and... Uh, predictive in what we need to do, when we need to do it, and therefore will be faster and, and more cost effective. Thank you for this yes, with different colors, but yes, so thank you, that's great. We're coming to the end of this panel. We don't have uh, Rudiger Crash with us, which as you know, was uh, ill, unfortunately, and that's why Justina read this statement this morning. But I would like just at the closing of this panel, mention this international dimension because R Rudiger would have done that. And we heard the video of Daniela Bass. And I think there was a double aspect to that, is that a lot of what we do in Europe now gain traction at the global level. European Funds Network, it was mentioned in the speech this morning that now we can start thinking what are the criteria to define centers of expertise in other places of the world, and also how do we use the digital technology to create these networks, what are the conditions to join an international network, so how do we accelerate the time for diagnosis and the time to bring the expertise to the patients, as you said before. We also see that in the access of medicines area, and we are starting discussion with WHO on how we could improve access to medicines, may not be the most expensive one, but the more well-established and pretty cheap one, but expand the market for these medicines in working with industry as much as possible in a win-win position, so better than in the past for that kind of approach of WHO, but in order to expand uh, access. So just to put that international dimension that is of mutual benefit. The international dimension, the globalization of rare disease, bring back traction into Europe at national level, but also what we do at European level brings new options for people, cousins, families, friends, and other people affected around the world. So with that, I would like to thank each of you. I would like to uh, wish you a good lunch. I hope you have enjoyed the session. And uh, you have the six tracks session starting at 2 p.m. So be sharp on time because there are limited time each sessions. So you don't want to start late. And thank you to Justina for sharing this morning session. Thank you.